here we are together again. Welcome, friends. It's myself and my erstwhile co-host, Gray Waste Tim. Say hello, Gray Waste Tim. Hello, everybody. Uh, I also have someone new. I know chat's been waiting. Um, I'd also like to introduce, this is Casilda. My put out a new video and got a new cat. Casilda, my put out a new video and got a new cat. Let's just kill that time loop there. We always like to keep the time loops separate when we can so nobody gets hodored. Um, new kitty. Yes, Tim. Welcome. I'm sorry. What was the name again, Tim? Uh, her name is Casilda. She's named after the queen from King in Yellow. But we just call her Cassie for short. Cassie. Okay, there we go. There's, that's more of a cat name. There we go. Well, I, Cleo's name is technically Cleopatra, but we don't. A Cleopatra, <laughs> if you prefer. Uh, oh, and what am I wearing? Is this a Praise Garth t-shirt? Oh, my goodness. Yes, it is. Tim, you got to order yours, buddy. Get, get one in. Um, so yeah, thanks for everyone who has ordered the shirts. They have just started coming in. So that's cool. And, uh, yeah. So what are we talking about today? Oh, yes. We're me and Tim are just here to gloat over our incredible content that we've been putting out. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> the deep ones video that everyone's been waiting for. I put that out. Tim put out the color out of a shy and these are both videos that we've been working on for a long time. Lots of fun. I feel like this is kind of a landmark week here, Tim. We are charting a new course. Not a new course, but we're going further in this vein of just some of the, some of the darker reaches, you know, mm -hmm. of, uh, of ice and fire. And they're tangentially connected because we're always talking about the oily black stone and the great empire of the dawn. So here's what we're going to talk about today, folks. Oh, let me just catch my breath. I'm so excited. I've got a few loose ideas from the Deep Ones video that I didn't get in there. Um, and there are some things we want to follow up on uh, about the ancient, about ancient Westeros before the long night and stuff when the Squisher cult was happening and stuff like that. And we're going to get into... Following up a couple of things I said about Yin and Sothorios, which I think I can push a little further, and that's going to lead us back to Ashai and some of the stuff that Tim had to say about Oily Black Stone and Stygi and what's turning the Shadowlands shadowy and the Oily Stone oily and all that stuff. So if you didn't watch Tim's Color Out of Ashai video, definitely watch that one if you're on the rewatch um, and you haven't seen it yet, definitely check that out. Or watch it after this one if you're watching live. So, gosh, where to start? Where to start? Tim, uh, well, <laughs> first of all, let's, let's, uh, what did you think of my Deep Ones video? Well, uh, since I have your number, I was telling you, like, you reminded me of a bunch of things. And then I ended up having to go, when I was working on my Color of a Shy video, uh, the part where I recorded myself here in the den talking on camera wasn't originally part of it that that was an after i had already recorded the entire reading i actually went back and did after the fact so that i could talk about that whole ib isle of toad things and it was because of the deep ones video you're the reminder of the isle of toads and that's when i was like oh yeah he he, he literally took the whole idea split it into multiple pieces and then repurposed them george part of george's gardener writing is also a lot of his recycling uh, George's writing style is, is he, even when he goes through redrafts, he never truly gives anything up. Like even the five year time split that he originally was going to do, he originally, he, he decided not to go through with that, but there's definitely ideas that we see crop up where it looks like those were things that he wanted to reuse. When we get other characters that seem like an older version of a character we already had. You can kind of see him be like, he didn't want to completely throw that whole idea out. He just repurposed it. And so too does he do with his influences. Yeah, well, I thought, I thought that uh, your intro was really good and helped sort of, it's always good to add that clarity at the beginning. A lot of times the best intros are written after you've done the whole script and you've really got all the ideas condensed, but... Yeah, we're going to follow up on some of that as far as the um, 
Again, the Kraken Stone and the Squid Ink symbolism. I say again, me and Tim were talking before the stream. I've got it. Yeah, there's another piece yet to Tim's to Tim's a shy theory that we can add. So we're going to start with, again, a couple of things about the Ironborn that I didn't fit in. Uh, and then we'll get to this Merlin King mythology stuff, which I think is really interesting. So the Children of Thralls. This is the first thing that I just kind of forgot to put in there. So check this out. This is Victarion's inner monologue. There were no slaves in the Iron Islands, only thralls. A thrall was bound to service, but he was not chattel. His children were born free, so long as they were given to the drowned god. So, according to, the, to my Deep Ones theory, all right, these thralls are all going to be patch-faced out, failed people that failed the drowning test. They didn't, they couldn't swim underwater. They're not good deep one hybrids. They're only suitable, suitable to be thralls. Their children, however, have a fresh chance. They've got deep ones DNA swimming around in there. And so they need to be tested too. And so that's where <laughs> this custom comes from, testing the children of thralls to see if they're good hybrids. As I turn on, there we go. Oh, that's better. So mm, makes all the difference. So yeah, I, I really, and, and that was one of the things that like really brought this together for me and that I had been holding on to. All these Ironborn streams, I never said it. The drowning ritual is a test to see if a child has the gift of the deep ones. And it may, just makes so much sense as far as swimming down to the drowned gods' watery halls and we come from the sea and all that stuff. And so, yeah, it makes sense that you'd want to test the children of the thralls. The, the original yeah, children. Oh, go ahead, Tim. I was going to say, it's interesting in that even though the Ironborn are sailors and mariners, they don't allow no anchor babies. Just because you're born here doesn't mean you're Ironborn. You got you to gotta pass this, uh, this citizenship test, basically, which is drowning you. <laughs> Right, and so it's also it's it's a way of bringing everyone into the cult as well, because when it, mm -hmm. when people are drowned, it gives the deep ones a potential to establish the psychic link, which I think definitely can be used to control the drowned men. So yes, it's like if you're on the Iron Islands, you can come there, you can be absorbed into Ironborn culture by being stolen by them, but you're gonna have to be drowned. <laughs> so that's part of the thing. Now, there's a, there's a funny nimble dick line about the squishers where he says, their sort don't ride horses. And I think, I, so I have not seen the film Dagon, but I did use clips from the movie. I, I've discovered it by searching for Deep One's artwork. Um, but uh, what was I just saying? Uh, oh, the horses. So squishers don't ride Ooh. horses, right? I think George is having a bit of fun with that. Um, so all of our squisher people have this weird relationship with horses. So Wyman Manderley, what's his nickname? Lord too fat to sit a horse, right? Yep. So he literally mm -hmm. is too big for the horse, which is the problem with squishers riding horses. And we see that with Biter. Biter it's several lines is given to how Biter's horse could just barely hold him up and it just looks like it's struggling. Okay. The Ironborn don't like riding horses. That's sissy Greenland stuff. Uh, it's people stuff is what it is. <laughs> it's not squisher stuff. So they don't like it. Um, and then yeah. Clarence crab, he wrote an Oryx. Uh, so yeah, there was just a bunch of that. I couldn't really fit that in there cause it was just too silly and there was no spot, but yeah. Squish yeah. their sword. Don't ride horses. Then Nib everything nimble Dick said is true. <laughs> they ride seahorses. Thank you. Blood Raven, Alexa. That is correct. <laughs> they ride seahorses. Um, yeah. So remember, I've been talking about this idea that oh, when you're drowned, it establishes a psychic link to the deep ones, right? And I found a great line about that, Tim. I'm going to jump forward just a little bit here. His brother Aaron would have known, but Aaron had seen the majesty of the drowned god's watery halls beneath the sea before being returned to life. That's a Victorian's inner monologue from A Dance with Dragons. So he thinks about Aaron has having been resurrected and having seen the drowned gods watery halls like this really is a patch facing 
you know, that Aaron has undergone. And so if, if I'm correct that this establishes the psychic link, well, we found the actual device. We found the walkie talkie mechanism, Tim, you're going to like this. Aaron Dampere is called a King's moot. Asha threw back her head and laughed. The drowned god must have shoved a prickle fish up Uncle Aaron's arse. A king's moot? Is this some jape, or does he mean it truly? The damp is not jape since he was drowned, and the other priests have taken up the call. Blind, barren, black-tied, Tarl the thrice-drowned, even old Grey Gull has left that rock he lives on to preach this king's moot across, all across Harlaw. The captains are gathering on Old Wick as we speak. So that's how it works. The drowned god shoves a prickle fish up your arse, and then you can receive the psychic messages. That's the walkie talkie. <laughs> Thought you'd appreciate that. That's important. You got to have, you know, the device, the chip. You got to get chipped, microchipped. So there's got to be a better system to this than shoving the fish up your ass. No, no, that's it. That's the best <laughs> that I could come up with. It's kind of perfect when you think about it. Or don't, or not. <laughs> don't think about it. Anyway, <laughs> just thought you guys would like that. <laughs> the pricklefish ritual. Yes, it's a little. There's a funny line in there. I don't think I kept it, but um, there's a funny line about how the wedding rituals to marry a salt wife are far less solemn than those to marry a rock wife. So it kind of makes you wonder if George wants to garden that out a bit. Like, What's the salt wife wedding? Does it have all sorts of silly, like, squisher seaweed stuff in there? Like, what do they do? Strange dances? Like, what's far less solemn mean? No no guesses, Tim? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's, it's uh, playing on the idea, that old the old idea that marriage is a prison because... Ironborn could take as many salt wives as they want, but they only have one rock wife. So taking your one walk, rock wife would be the more solemn affair, whereas your salt wife, that's your salt wife is more of your side piece. So your wedding to her is seen more, is seen less as a solemn duty and more just as a, hey, fun, these are happy, these are happy fun times. Uh, so Kelly Johnson's asking how the Squisher folk um, take their captives to undersea kingdoms since it seems the transit would kill them. Well, th we have the drowning ritual first. That may be part of it. It's just like you drown them and resurrect them and then they can live underwater and do what they need to do. Um, definitely killing them could just be a part of what they do. As I mean, they're eating certain kids. As far as breeding with the women, how that works, I don't know why you have to ask about the details of that, Kelly. You could just leave those things unspoken, but I'm not sure. Um, if you watched... The science fiction movie or TV series that was canceled after season two by Ridley Scott on Kepler-22b. Um, somebody help me out. What's the name of the freaking show? It had squishers in it, Tim. And what they did when they took babies, because they abducted children by the shoreline, it's always that way, they had a chest cavity thing. And it opened up. It was all weird. And they put the little baby in, raised by wolves, thank you. Mm. I, I, I should have grabbed the image for this and used it and put it in the video. But they have a chest cavity, Tim. It opens up and they put the baby inside and then it closes and they dive down into the water. And inside that cavity, there's going to be weird evolution happening that's going to enable them to then be a fish people. So, like, who knows? Fill in the blanks however you want. Uh, but they are abducting children and women to breed with somehow. That, that does seem clear. Kelly wants the details. Uh, let's see, has the sun set on the Deep One's empire and like the children, are they a shadow of their former glory? That's a great question. We really, so it's hard to say, but all the magic in the world seems to be stirring that could just be stimulating the Deep Ones. Um, it could be that their cult is always active a little bit. It's just that it used to be more active in ancient day. 
Why would why would the Deep One cult ebb and flow, Tim? Any ideas about that? Well, when so I've talked about how this the the oily black stone in Lovecraft, this trapezohedron, how it moves from place to place, and that's how the deep and that's why these things keep happening. It's because the deep ones are the ones moving it. But there is a point in time where they lose it, and that is when it it resu- when it ends up in Egypt and it ends up in the hands of Nefren Ka, the Black Pharaoh, mm-hmm. because he has it in two when he dies, and he's placed in his black sarcophagus and enshrined in his tomb with all of his worldly possessions, like pharaohs are wont to do. He has the stone buried with him, and for deep ones, while they can probably get up into the River Nile. The idea of them trekking through the desert to get the stone back is not what is not one that's doable. That's why the trapezohedron stays hidden until a bunch of British and American archaeologists dig it up, and that's how it finds its way back into the world. So, for in Lovecraft, for the deep ones, there is a point in time where they do lose their their sole powerful artifact for four centuries. Because mm. it just ends up in a spot where they can't get to. Mm. If something ends up too, when something ends up too far inland for the squishers to get, that's when there's going to be troubles for them. Interesting, interesting notion. So that gives us another idea, like what could they want? Maybe they want a certain idol back. Obviously, it's not the sea stone chair. They could get that any time. It's mm. it's. It's on the edge of a crumbling sea stack. They could cl- they could claim that anytime. So, um, yeah. Oh, which but reminds me up- of a clue that I have forgot been forgetting to use for many videos. There is a line about the sea stacks of Pike being like the pillars of a sea god's temple. And we've been saying who built Pike? Oh, I think it was the the deep ones and the hybrid thralls and the successful hybrids of the lords who live up in the castles. It's a sea god's temple, like the castle. That's what it is. So that's one of those lines that sounds poetic at first, and then you go back and look at it, and you're like, wait, no, that's literally true. <laughs> so there you go. Um, so the th- one of the things that I just wanted to highlight, I did say it in the video, but I just wanted to spell it out more clearly. On the Three Sisters, it's the most webby-handed people who become the lords. And then there's the line from Patchface when he says, you know, the mermaids will greet us when we come down to the watery halls. And then Asha says, the mermaids blow into seashells to greet their lords. And you put those together, it implies Patchface as a lord. And of course he is, because he's been drowned and resurrected. So he is like a lord or prophet. So it is a similar thing on the Iron Islands. We can assume that just as I was theorizing, the hybrids were the lords. Those are in charge. Who's in charge? The squishiest people. So I just wanted to sort of spell that out. Like when you look around, you can see, and there's more of that coming, which is with this Marlin King stuff. Yeah. Now the last, and I think oh, go ahead, a- Tim. I was going to say, I think it's a testament to um, with the Church of Starry Wisdom, which is another thing that George pulls whole scale straight from Lovecraft. But in his story, the Church of Starry Wisdom is popular in port towns. And that would make sense. Port towns are on the water. So port towns would be the towns that are also going to be the ones that squishers and deep ones could have contact with. When you take a look at the story as at the story, The places that don't seem to have these deep one or squisher myths are always the places that are the furthest inland. But another thing that George does is a lot of his a lot of his most prominent houses. And this makes sense for a real life for a real life thing is that they're usually on some kind of water. If they're not a coastal town, then there's usually some kind of major river or lake, some kind of major water source. Now that that again, that makes sense. Most civil, most major civilizations are built along water. That's why coastal cities tend to be more higher populated, even than cities even in the in the midwestern states. But it, it makes sense, though, by having so much be so close to water means that the 
potential for deep one influence is always there. The places that are furthest away from water also tend to be the places that are smaller and lesser populated and less powerful. Yeah, man, this thing started as a damn joke, you know, with Nimble Dick Squisher Hunt, and I'm putting the, the faces <laughs> up on the map. I'm like, look, they're everywhere. But, like, they really are. You can see, like, pretty much anywhere. If you're near the shoreline, it's like a place like this, there might be squishers, you know? That's just how it is. If you're, if you're near the rocks or the tide line, it's just, you gotta watch out. So, um, real quick, a couple of things in the chat. Yes, I want to, I'm going to get on TikTok. I'm, I got a bunch of ideas for videos. I thought I was going to have a slow January instead. It's a busy January. I got lots of content coming. I just recorded a Damon video, by the way. I'm Tim's favorite character. Not that Tim <laughs> endorses everything Damon does, but it's a story character is very interesting. So, I've got a nice Damon video, just recorded it. That's coming next week. Uh, but yes, uh, TikTok is coming too. And then the other thing is, Shane Scully, you've left a couple of nice comments here in the chat about Irish folklore. Can I beg you to leave a comment below the video? Because I don't um, have time to process what you're saying. And I really don't know Irish folklore that well. So I'm going to have to research and look up the names you're mentioning. But please leave a comment after the stream is done so that I can follow up with you. Uh, yeah, okay, you're talking about Elk, Elkmar in Irish folklore who took a Fomorian bride who are kind of like squishers. Yeah, see, I, I only vaguely know what you're talking about, but yeah. Oh, no, don't, no, don't apologize. Uh, thank you. I'm just saying leave a comment, um, because the chat disappears. Leave it below the video so it will be there. And later when I'm not distracted, I can follow up and uh, do the research. So yes, thank you. No no apologies necessary. You're, you're, you're good people. You're, you're the people we want around here. <laughs> All right, so um, let's see. Another PayPal question. Assuming the Squishers built a shy. Oh, no, we can't assume that. Oh, that's a big question that we'll get to later in the stream when we talk about some of Tim's ideas from his last video. That is one possibility. However, Tim and I both favor a different possibility. Even though the Squid Idol is obviously a Squishers thing, we don't think the Deep One's built a shy. It's complicated. We'll explain it. So, good question, and we'll get there. Uh, okay, so... Green men and children in the cult. This is a couple people asked me about this, and I mentioned it briefly. But I do think, Tim, that it wasn't just humans that got hybridized by the squishers. I think that the first thing we can say is that definitely it was also children of the forest or maybe humans who had children of the forest DNA that then got hybridized. But the Cranog men, Tim in your opinion and my opinion, are descended both from Deep Ones and Children of the Forest, right? Yes. Yeah, The the just in the way that the Starks seem to have the blood of the other, the, the Cranog men seem to have the blood of the children. And as, if we go back to, like, the dawn, if we go back to, like, the primordial soup of Planetos, it just kind of, you kind of get the sense that everyone was just banging everyone. That's why Garth, you know, that's that's why someone like Garth the Green, his, uh, his motto, his motto basically should be any holes a goal as well as smoke weed every day. But <laughs> that's the thing. Like, it kind of seems like these inter, these interspecies relations seem to run the gambit from everywhere. That it's not just humans partaking, that it wasn't just Valyrian blood magic and these uh, Golgotha flesh pits in, in Sothorios that it seems like everyone was kind of dabbling with everyone. Now, some of those, I don't quite understand the physics, like if a child of the forest got together with a giant, but I don't knock out the idea that it could, that it could have happened because something, somehow we end up with the Lengi who are eight feet tall, but have a lot of children of the forest uh, features to them. So, but it's a fantasy, so anything can happen. Anything's possible. Well, I mean, of course, I think the answer with the Lengi is that the old ones are the green men and that they are tall. Mm -hmm. They are tall children of the forest. Um, 
So with the the Cran Hog Men specifically, figuring out that they are part child of the forest, that's easy. They they clearly are. They're said to be, and that's why they're small and they've got the green side and all that. The thing is that I highlighted in one of the older videos, Ironborn videos, I've I don't cannot remember which information was in which one. I, they're all a thing to me now, a continuum. But the descriptions of the Cranog men, and when I say descriptions, I really should say like the slant, the slander, and the sort of uh, little folk tales and biases that people say about them match the squishers, uh, the pointed teeth and the green skin and moss under their armpits instead of hair. And then um, Mira and Jojen both talk about some chronic mud being able to breathe mud and mm -hmm. Howland being able to turn earth to water, earth to mud, which means he can control water. So there's a lot of watery stuff. And then, of course, uh, Greywater Watch is some sort of floating castle that they can move around, maybe with magic or maybe with just cool swamp technology of floating lightweight you know constructions or whatever yeah. but some um, kind of house boat. <laughs> yeah exactly some rafty <laughs> some rafty thing but the point is uh there's a lot of watery stuff there a lot of water magic breathing underwater ideas that sound like squishers and then the other part is to get back to what you said at the beginning the men from ib mm. okay um so Basically, and I'll let you do the longer version of this, but essentially the Cranog men living next to Moat Kalen is very similar to the men of Ib and the story of the doom that came to Sarnath, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yes, because this goes back to how what I said in my uh, Color Out of a Shy video when I was giving my opening premise and I used Ib as an example before jumping into the even more a shy Color Out of Space thing. But what George loves to do is he'll take a Lovecraftian idea, he'll take a whole scale idea, name, place, and the ideas behind it, and he'll break them up and he'll repurpose them. And Ib is a great example of this. Uh, because Ib, <laughs> hey Garth, Ib in the Doom That Came to Sarnath, uh, it's populated by these little frog guys who dance under the moon in their gray stone city and they worship this giant stone idol of a water lizard of their god Bokrog. And water lizard could mean an actual water lizard because lizards kind of, aside from Arctic conditions, lizards can live everywhere. You got desert, jungle, and water lizard. Or possibly water lizard refers to salamander, which is an amphibian that looks like a lizard. Either or, they both work because George does George does this in his story too, where at certain animals can be interchangeable. We've talked about crows and ravens sometimes filling the same role. So the same idea falls there. So what George does is he takes the name Ib and he applies it to his island where he puts his version of dwarves there. The Ibanese, very stocky, very hairy, whalers and miners. They read very much like Tolkien's dwarves. And Ib, the port of Ibn, is described as a gray stone city. So that aspect of the original Ib stays. However, the frogmen, he changes out. We no longer have the little froggy guys. We have dwarves. But the froggy guys appear elsewhere. We get the Isle of Toads, where we have a stone statue of an amphibian, this toad, made out of the greasy black stone like a shy and yin. And it's worshipped by some very fishy looking people. Right. And then the whole frogman idea gets applied to the Cranog men on a symbolic level. Be, that's it. That's like a slur against the Cranog men as frogmen, but also, but even on a more metaphysical level, which is because of their connections to the children of forest. They're living in a marsh in swamps. This idea that they might breathe water, breathe mud, that they can that they can live on a floating castle like a giant lily pad. All the frogman imagery is there. So you see how George took the whole original Lovecraft concept of Ib, just broke it into smaller pieces and then put the and then dotted them all over his own map. Right. And the key thing here to realize is that the Cranog men, as the frogmen, they match the pattern because they're next to Moat Kalen. So here Moat Kalen mm. 
is serving both as sort of like the black stone idol because it's made of black stone that might be greasy stone. And it also functions a little bit like the city of Sarnath itself, which was destroyed. And now it's mm-hmm. like, oh, it was this great civilization. Now no one even knows like hardly that anyone was there. So same with Moat Kalen. It's still there, but it's so destroyed that we don't know who built it or really what it was doing. And the area is all flooded. And so, yeah, yeah. it's, Basically, it's there's three iterations of this pattern of the original frog, you know, men of Ib being frog people who worship a black stone idol. The people on the mm-hmm. Isle of Toads with their toadstone, the men of Ib on actual Isle of Ib who are like dwarves who have a gray stone city, and then the Cranog men. So what basically what that tells us is that George is thinking of the Cranog men as kind of serving the role as the men of Ib. So, and the men of Ib in Lovecraft, they are Deep One related. There's, remember, Tim, Tim has explained to us there are three different types of fish humans or whatever. The men of mm-hmm. Ib are one of those types, but they are aquatic people. So yeah. this is all a long way of saying, and don't worry, I'm not cutting my hair. I haven't cut it in... A year and a half, at least the long part. It's been seriously a year and a half. Haven't touched it. The, uh, this part of, I'm growing out a little bit. But, anyways, um, <clears throat> that means it's it's a it makes it more likely that the Cranog men are in fact part Deep One, as well as part Child of the Forest. And that again tells us that the Deep Ones are farming either Children of the Forest directly, or probably mm-hmm. more likely humans who have already interbred with the children of the forest. However, they might be hybridizing with green men directly. And we're going to, this is going to come up over and over today. Okay. First of all, the green, there's certain attributes of the deep ones that sound like the green men. For example, on the, uh, the thousand islands, the fishy people there have green skin just like the green men are said to have green skin. And then you can see the two sigils uh, to my right here. One is the Manderly sigil, and it, that's got the, uh, the Merling King. And then the other one is the Grey Iron sigil with the Sea King. And you'll notice they both have green beards and green hair. Just mm-hmm. like Garth Greenhand, who's said to have green hair. So, like... Why is there so many parallels? And this is not a easy, I'm not ans- asking you to answer this question. This is something we're going to work on, but like it's, it's kind of been growing and bugging at, bugging me like, huh, green men and deep one hybrids. Like there's something going on here, but the more key thing is that Durin God's grief is either a green man or a green seer type. All right. And he married Eleni, who seems like a mermaid. And then we have the Grey King, who also seems like a green seer at the very least. And I think there are clues that he was a green man, by the way. And he married a mermaid, too. So you have potentially um, green men marrying mermaids. And uh, what is, what, so what's going on there? Uh, that, that sounds like they're being indoctrinated into the cult. And that we're creating hybrid children from green men and squishers, or is that how it all started? I don't know your thoughts. Yeah, it seems like, like I said, it seems like it's uh, like there's, we get these certain areas that just become like these big melting pots of all of these different interspecies. Uh, I see someone in chat brought up Lorath and thank you for that. Cause Lorath's another good example of this. Lorath mm-hmm. starts off with the maze makers who are said to have, who are said to be, half giant some somehow have giant's blood but then the maze makers disappear supposedly in wars against selkies and walrus men and then after that we get stories of the hairy men showing up at lorath who sound like they're progenitors of the ibanese until finally we get the valerians come in and we get this offshoot valerians who settle lorath and then start this whole blind god religion. So it's like one people group moves in, mingles with another. Sometimes it's peaceful, sometimes it's warlike. Something happens, they go away, but there are still 
remnants of them offspring from the time where they where they did interact together and then new people come in and then they add their bloodlines into this and it's all of this constant mixing that we end up finally and it's and then you you do that over the course of generations and then eventually you end up with some kind of god baby and that's kind of where our story is at here when we're thinking of azor a high reborn the prince that was promised these different prophecies you when you finally get the perfect mix of all of the correct bloodlines that are going to create this but sometimes that could also involve having some it's not just a matter of oh we needed a targaryen and a stark to come together it also means that a hundred year a hundred or two hundred years ago we also needed a lizard person and an other to do the deed somewhere along the line too i am the lizard queen <laughs> <clears throat> yeah it's so look, I've go I've gone further than anyone else with the help of Grey Waste Tim as far as explaining what these damn deep ones are doing in the story. Um the last frontier of that is figuring out how specifically they're going to interact with the story. And the best things I have are Patchface and Aaron, you know, Aaron being used as a tool uh, to maybe play a trick on Euron or, you know, turn your whatever Euron's doing to the Deep One's advantage. But that just leads us to the question of, well, what, is, what do the Deep Ones want to do with Euron's magic? And of course, in all the Lovecraft stories, the Deep Ones are operating on the agenda of Cthulhu. And mm -hmm. th that agenda comes from space or something. So, like we probably won't be able to know what the deep one agenda is. The The first thing we know is like self breeding and self sustaining. Um, yeah. And the whole point of the cult and controlling people on land is to get people to give them people to breed with. That is the point of the cult. Um, but is there a more loftier long-term goal? It's hard to say. Um, yeah. Well, it's a question we talked about before when I brought up, xenomorph theory theory and you've 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 expanded on that with the dracomorph theory but it's the idea of why do the deep ones breed with humans is it because they want to or because they have to and that can go one of two ways either they want to because there's some kind of inherent strength in hybrids mm -hmm. where a deep one human hybrid is better than say a pure deep one or a pure human and that that's something that goes in, that goes into a lot of things like dampiers, for example, half vampires that can walk through, that can walk in sunlight. They're not as powerful as full blood, but they don't have that weakness. Sometimes the hybrid is the stronger organism. So that's one idea. But then the other, which is the xenomorph theory, which is that deep ones have to breed with humans because for whatever reason, they need some kind of conduit in order to in order to uh, populate xenomorphs uh the al which are the creatures from alien they always need some kind of host to go from uh face hugger to chest burster to full adult xenomorph there needs to be a conduit in between so that's what i favor is um yeah it's like a, a weird hybrid life cycle um what i wondered there tim is is there an answer within george's magical lore and mechanics about how this began because if it is that way that means the deep ones can't have been alive or existent longer than humans if they need humans to reproduce they can't be older mm -hmm. than humans um so then yeah. it's like well how are they created so that they need humans to exist how did that happen um were we talking about was you know skin changing basically is what i got to like is skin changing a part of this and is that the reason why we see deep ones hybridizing with green men and children of the forest. Can you think of a way? And then there's the far winds, of course, who have color changing eyes and might skin change seals and know about, you know, the land across the sea. Yeah. For me, uh, I prefer, I prefer the hybrid theory. I'm about to break um, <laughs> over, over Xenomorph theory because I know it, it works in Alien, but to me, the idea of a species that can't reproduce on its own does not sound like one that should be successful. Not one that's going to 
that's going to last thousands, if not millions of years, the way deep ones have. So for me, the idea of hybridization, that somewhere along the lines, deep ones just just discovered, probably through trial and error, that hybrid that hybrids between them and humans actually make for stronger offspring. That's what creates this. And that plays into the idea of dragon creation. If we think that dragons aren't a natural creature, but are created through Valyrian blood magic. Um, Quinn, the GM, actually just put out a video today, too, about the, uh, going over this as well. The idea that dragons are a product of fireworms, wyverns, and some kind of human element to it, which would explain dragon intelligence, and also is another way of explaining the whole dragon has three heads. Well, it's because if dragons are actually a chimera of three different creatures brought on by Valyrian blood magic. You watched Quinn the GM's video this morning, didn't you? Yeah, I just said, yeah, Quinn's okay. video. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Cool. Shout out to Quinn. And um, by the way, here is, if you want a Garth t-shirt, you can get them here. Bonfire.com slash praise dash Garth. They come in a different color, a couple different colors. I think I got, um, which one did I get? I guess this is no. This is this is probably not charcoal. This is like tan. There's a few different. Uh, oh, comfort. Sea foam. No, that's not the one I got. Which one did I get, Shad? Which color did you order for me? It might be this one. Yeah, this is not heather gray. This is like tan. Uh, well, sorry. I'll figure out what color I got, but. Um, yeah, it's really nice. The, it's nice and soft. The weight is good. Uh, the print is good. So I'm very happy with the, the quality. Feel free to order away. And uh, yeah, there it is. So back to the squishers. Um, let's see, where were we? Ah, uh, yes. Hybridizing green men. <clears throat> we know that it just, it seems like it happened. Like the Grey King is a green seer and he's got a mermaid wife. During God's grief, coded as a green man, he's got a mermaid wife. So it's just, these two are meeting somehow. And that may be important if the greens, if the deep ones are trying to get a hold of skin changer or green seer magic for some reason. So I just want to put a pin in that in case anyone has an idea to push that further. But, uh, yeah. Let's see here. Um, because, right, see, the others can't reproduce on their own. And that's why I was saying they were specifically created or transformed. And that's how they got that way. They're not mm -hmm. really an old race that's just native to the planet. Like, they were created. And so it's the same thing. If the Deep Ones need people to reproduce, then that would indicate that they are a created you know, species. Mm -hmm. And it does, now that I think about it, it probably is that they are their own species because the deep ones are usually like millions of years old and stuff, right? Like they're more primitive than humans mm -hmm. in Lovecraft evolution. Yeah. And that would make sense at least in Lovecraft way too. Cause like I said, when they lost, when they lose the black stone for centuries, when it's buried in the sands of Egypt, but they never go away. So that means that even though they weren't, there was this period of time, this period of inactivity where they're no longer farming humans, they still eventually come back. And that would mean that they had to have still been able to reproduce at least among other members of their own species in order to create that, would in order to make that happen. Otherwise, they would have died out just a few years after the stone was locked away. I think that partly the reason that they could be trying to create hybrids is so that they can have power on land because the mm -hmm. deep ones themselves are pretty confined to the sea, right? Like they can yeah. come out to the shore, but like they need to stay wet and probably want to get right back in the water pretty soon, right? Yeah, because that, that's the whole Innsmouth idea is that they start off, the idea of hybrid humans with an Innsmouth is you start off uh, looking human and you spend a good majority of your life on land it's not until that they reach middle age, till they're in their 40s, that the very prominent 
fishy looking features start to appear. And even in color out of, in, uh, not color out of, shadow out of Innsmouth, when Robert Olmsted is wandering the streets, it's, it's not, he sees the middle-aged people who look kind of fishy, but it's the very elderly are the ones that he don't see, that he doesn't see at all. And that's because they're the ones that look. Oh, Tim. Did we freeze? Uh, there? Just, just for a second, it choked. I don't know if it was me or you, but go ahead. Okay. So what I was saying was uh, it's the elderly uh, that he doesn't see on the street because they're the ones that are close, that look the most fishy and are going to be the ones that go to the water. So really... When you think about it for Innsmouth, you don't go into the water until you're already in your senior years. Going into the water becomes your retirement plan. Um, yes. And but but again, the purpose of that is for the deep ones to have power on land, right? I mean because the majority of their life is spent on land. Like it's like I said, if you're if you don't go full deep one until you're already in your 60s or 70s, well then the majority of your the majority of your life if you were truly human has already been spent as a human. You've now reached the year the age of retirement, which is when you go into the water. Anything that you wanted to accomplish, you've had all that time to accomplish. I know. I'm in my 40s. So I need to like Watch out, make sure I just stay in shape and uh, keep those fish well, attributes held 20, off as long as possible. Yeah, 20 years from now, the ocean's going to start calling to you. I definitely want to get remarried before that starts happening. It'll be harder to get dates after I have, like, after I'm pop eyed and wide of mouth. <laughs> All right, so, like I said, the squishers have green teeth. The Thousand Islands people have green skin, and the Merlin King has a green beard. So there's multiple attributes of the Deep Ones that kind of sound like green men, and that's just curious. So put a pin in that, and let's talk about the Merlin King. So the Merlin King seems to be a narrow sea legend, right? Mm-hmm. And that's mostly yeah. where we find it. Um, so, for example, White Harbor, which we talked about, they've got statues of this Merlin King, or and he's called Old Fishfoot. He's got the green beard and the trident. I'll pull up the quote in a second. And, uh, you know, White Harbor, it's got phases to it. So the new White City was built by the Manderleys when they came there, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,400 years ago. Older than that, is the Blackstone Wolfsten Fortress. Not oily Blackstone that we know of, but just Blackstone. I think it's said to be basalt, actually. And uh, it is on the other side of the river. It's got the giant weirwood in it. And that was built by John Isai's. Um No. It was built by a John Stark... But then it was later Brandon Ice Eyes who came and set it free. And I just got those two things confused. It was a John Stark who built the Wolf Den. Point is, before the Wolf's Den was built, it was already, there was a place there. Okay? And so the fishy mythology at White Harbor, we can assume is the oldest layer. Because we know that the, you know, the worship of the old gods is something that happened after the pact. And so at some point, first men came there and built that castle, probably around the weirwood. You know, it's sort of implied that the first men are building castles and planting weirwoods in the gardens. It's not that way. The, the first men build castles around the weirwoods, which are older. So there seems to have been a weirwood here at the river mouth, just as there is a weirwood at the Whispers on the end of the peninsula. Okay. Weirwoods do seem to like to grow near water, I guess is what I'm trying to imply. So this, there was a time at White Harbor when basically this Merlin King culture was dominant. And it's the first thing that was there. and Everything else is layered on top of it. So it's probably very related to the Three Sisters, where we have the same hybridization going back 5,000 years or more. 
So then we hear about the Merlin King again when we bring up Clarence Crab. Clarence Crab supposedly fought the Merlin King. And very nearby, Crackclaw Point, is a geological feature called the Spears of the Merlin King. And these are little rocky juts that stick up from the water, like little tiny sea monster. I don't know what they're called, but they are, some of them are big enough to be very small islands. And that's, of course, Davos washes up on one of those which is really a long way to travel from King's Landing, by the way. Um, we'll look at it on the map in a second. But those are called the Spears of the Merlin King. And there is... Um, oh, yeah, Ursula Upcliff doesn't belong there. That's different. I, w I got that confused. That is not Clarence Crabbe's wife. Clarence Crabbe's wife is a woods, wits, woods witch, but she does not have a name. Um, I just think it's interesting that uh, it, the whispering of the heads turns out to be the whispering of the waves. And so this idea of the language of the waves is being conflated mm -hmm. with green seer language because talking heads in a cave, that's, you know, dead people that talk to you in a weird cave. That's coded. That's very obvious green seer symbolism. So when Brienne says, oh, it's actually just the sea rushing into the cave. It's interesting. It's just more conflation of green men and see stuff. And then, of course, uh, Peter Baelish. He's got a boat named the Merlin King. At first, it's just a, a, a ship from Bravos that he takes. But then later, it kind of seems like his ship. So it's hard to say, but Peter Baelish himself is kind of like the Merlin King there. And he is abducting Sansa in the scene mm -hmm. where he pulls up to King's Landing on the Merlin King and then he takes her back to uh, his stronghold in the Vale. So, which is, of course, at the Pebbles, right on the shoreline. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the Merlin King ship, it's from Bravos, And Bravos is a place that has its own Merman and Merlin King stuff going on. So, of course, mm -hmm. there are the, the courtesans who all take mermaid names. Uh, Bravos's canals are basically a symbolic metaphor for the Weirwood Net, which is like a maze in the Green Sea. Mm -hmm. And then in the House of Black and White, the Melring King. Who's that? The Melring. The Merling King. He is worshipped by sailors. And actually, yeah. that's worth looking up. Sailors worship either the Merling King or the Moon Pale Maiden. And that's interesting because when we talk about mythical astronomy. Yeah, the moon controlling the tides. Moon controlling so the tides and also the moon falling into the sea being the drowned god. Oh, it's the drowned god quote I'm thinking of. Yeah, never mind. We'll get to that later. But yeah, the Merlin King is in the House of Black and White. Mm -hmm. So he is a known figure. So then there's the Driftmark, which I didn't mention in the Deep Ones video. Um, oh, good, good point, Eldrick Stoneskin. The Titan of Bravos might be a depiction of the Merlin King as well. The Merlin King is depicted, uh, depicted uh, as, you know, he's a stone statue. He's got green hair and the broken trident. The Titan of Bravos has green hair and a broken sword and rises from the sea. That's, that's a good parallel. I'll have to think about that Eldrick Stone skin, but good point. Yeah, and it's it's also a lingering connection with S that keeps Sansa and Arya bonded because Arya is at the House of Black and White, where sailors are coming to war to worship the Merlin King. But it is the Merlin King, the ship, which uh, which ushers S Sansa away from King's Landing, and it's through Peter Baelish, who has Bravosi ancestry from his grandfather or great I, grandfather or great grandfather i forget which but point is peter baelish is part part bravosi so the yes. fact that he has a bravosi ship working for him and his perth and his house's sigil is like we sometimes forget house baelish's personal sigil it their house sigil is the the titan of bravos the mockingbird is just uh little fingers personal sigil correct um, so, who, okay, so the Driftmark, the Valarians, um, mm -hmm. 
And we'll come back to that. Eldrick Stone skin, I feel like there's more there with the Titan. Uh, and, of course, Eldrick is highlighting the fact that they are statues. And the Great King turned into a statue. So, the Driftmark. The Valarions, supposedly, and remember the Valarions come from Valyria. They came to Driftmark, we don't know when. Seemingly before the Targaryens, probably not too long before. Um, Valeria established Dragonstone about 100 years before the Targaryens came there, and thus 200 years before the Doom. So one guesses Driftmark would have been settled around the same time, but we don't know. However, the story is that the first Valarions won the Driftwood throne from the Merling King to conclude a pact. That's all the information we have about it. No, on House of the Dragon, they gave us a very cool rendition of that Driftwood throne, which I thought was cool. And then uh, the funeral rites for Lena mentioned the Merlin King as well. They spoke of uh, returning to the eternal waters, which are the dominion of the Merlin King. So it sounds similar to going down to the Drowned God's watery halls. It's basically the same language. So there is two things here. There is a general belief in a Merlin King as some sort of sea god or something. And then there is this uh, pact thing. So the Driftwood Throne is interesting because, of course, over on the Iron Islands, we have Driftwood Crowns. Um, and the Grey King is said to have worn the first Driftwood Crown, although he's also said to have worn a crown of Nagas Fangs, which we know is Weirwood. So Weirwood Crown, Driftwood Crown... It's hard to know if this is all the same thing or not. But certainly, a Driftwood throne would go very nicely with a Driftwood crown. So this sounds like a similar cultural practice, a similar cult practice, if you will. And the pact thing is, is important too, because Tim, like in Shadow of Innsmouth, the Deep Ones don't just come and steal you. They make pacts, and that's how you get a cult, right? Mm -hmm. yeah um actually one thing i wanted to bring up because it's just a thought that popped in my head um regarding the manderleys and their merlin king imagery because they're not originally from white harbor right they're originally they're originally a reach house they lived on the man that's where the river mander gets its name right but even though we just said like the merlin king seems to be all associated with places along the narrow sea uh, the reach is pretty far from there. That's that's going pretty pretty far inland with yeah. this Merlin King stuff. Well, no, so I think the I was... Merlin, that's why I think the Merlin King is in White Harbor first, and they they got taken over by that culture when they came there. But go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say because we've talked about the Grey King and Garth the Green connections. If they had the if the Merlin King stuff was happening when they were still a reach house then that's kind of like bringing some Grey King ideas into some heavy Garth territory. So it just made me wonder, is this, is the peak kicking them out more a turf war? Is this like a gang thing? Bloods and Crips, you wore, you wore gray and green territory. That's the wrong color. Yeah, so <laughs> but, they're, yeah. they're still riding for the, uh, the Selkies that <laughs> Owen Oakenshield drove off of the Shield Islands. Those are the Mandalese descendants and they're still pissed about it. No, I think, <laughs> Tim, I think that what's going on here is that the Manderleys coming from the Reach are Knights of the Green Hand, which they still claim to be. So that's like the next best thing to being green men. They're humans, but they worship green men and Garth the Green and all that stuff, okay? So they bring mm -hmm. that practice to White Harbor, and that gets taken over by the Merman stuff. Merman's Court old fish foot so it's the same pattern as during god's grief marrying a mermaid and the gray king marrying a mermaid so it's like you have these green seers green men figures repeatedly get co-opted by the deep ones so the mandalees hmm. are doing it the same pattern with symbolism by being knights of the green hand they get kicked out of the reach and they go to white harbor and they become they join Deep One's cult. They get hybridized. I think that's what's going on.
Yeah, because that is it's another way of doing a cultural exchange of ideas, only there were some monsters involved along the way. Because it's like the culture, it's everywhere. Like the mermaid stuff, like it's so widespread. That's a case of the Mandalus putting on floppy ears when they come there to me. Like that's the oldest culture layer. And it must have been the only layer there at, at one time. It's so it's like the three sisters are what happens if no Manderleys come and they just retain a culture based on pirating and having web handed, you know, webby hands. So, yeah, I do think that green man symbolism is very important. So now they are green men who rule under the sea. So this is kind of telling you who is the Merlin King. Wyman Manderley is a Merlin King archetype. And who is he? He's a green man who was drowned and now lives under the sea. You dig? Mm -hmm. So this is what I'm saying about the Merlin King. I think the Merlin King is not a, there's not one. I think a, a Merlin King is basically just a hybrid squisher king. And so when we look at the three sisters and say, oh, well, the lords are the, the most hybridized. And on the Iron Islands, the hybrids seem to be the lords and Patchface is a lord. This is the merman's court. This is the Merlin King's court. This is who he is. He's a drowned green man. And somehow that's a Merlin King. So basically a powerful magician or a hybrid that becomes a ruler over an area. So I think there would have been Merlin Kings all over the narrow sea. It's, it's a position. It's a type of person like a dragon King, a Merlin King. So that's, that's kind of my first theory about them. Yeah. Cause if we think gray King, gray King takes a mermaid to bride, whatever children he has with her would be hybrid, would be some kind of hybrid creature. But they'd also be prince since he's a king, they'd also be princes and princesses. The natural idea would be that they would be the ones to then take the throne when he passes. And that's something that goes all the way back to Great Empire of the Dawn and the God on Earth. The Pearl Emperor, because the God on Earth is like a divine being, but he has a child, the Pearl Emperor, and the Pearl Emperor is like this high this uh this first hybrid emperor, this first hybrid king, while the god on earth returns to his forebearers in his pearl palaquin. So, yeah, the idea is 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 there is that you get the high once you get the hybrid, but the hybrids are still going to follow through with the human traditions in becoming the next lord, the next king, the next emperor, what have you. Yeah, so it kind of works, I think. Um... Green Seer King, Dragon King, Merlin King. So mm -hmm. eventually it becomes mythicized as, you know, a figure or a demigod or whatever. But yeah, I think it's a type of figure. Um, and then so lastly, we have Ursula Upcliffe from the Vale, who is a sorceress that lives at the time of the Andal Conquest. She's a first man, Vale, Woods Witch, and she claims to be the bride of the Merlin King. Uh, so that's interesting because Ursula is the name of a sea witch, an a, a mm -hmm. octopus bottomed sea witch. Um, so yeah. you have thoughts, Tim? So, yeah, they're called uh, Sakailas, which are they, these are another creature from folklore, uh, the half human, half octopus, which, uh, I said to you, of all the ironborn things that we have done, I'm very surprised that the Sakaila has never come up before. It took having a character literally named Ursula for us to get get to it. But then, so after I realized that, I went a digging because that's what I do, and I looked up the I looked into Sakailas and found found some stories from their folklore. Uh, they're very prominent in Native American folklore. Okay, and two. Two stories that I found. Well, actually, it's it's one story, but it has two different tellings of a Sakaila and a 
Raven Man, and this relates, and both the way both the way both tellings go, I found can relate back to Euron in a way. In one telling, a Raven Man spots the Sakaila woman from afar, and he becomes so overcome with lust, and then he assaults her and he R words her. But this reminded me like of Euron when he does the same to Victarion's salt wife. Uh, Victarion's salt, his salt wife, would be considered a kraken woman at this point. Euron is the crow's eye, and I had said, like, we talked about how sometimes crows and ravens can be interchangeable. And Euron is the antithesis to Ironborn stuff. He's like someone, he is Ironborn, but he's there to instigate and antagonize them. It's why he has the, the, uh, storm god imagery that he has, even though the storm god is the enemy of the drowned god. It's why he's the bad brother, uh, the one who undoes the, the original idea of the bad brother who usurped the king's moot, which is the idea of Aaron now trying to reestablish it, but Euron making a mockery of it because he wins the king's moot. But it's also uh, the anti Euron being a crow in compared to aquatic, aquatic creatures, he becomes the antithesis to that because it's the, we, we, that old adium of, you know, uh, Birds got to swim, fish got to fly. I, I, I said that right. Don't correct me. Uh, but yeah, yeah, he's the he's the he's the, he's the antithesis under the of sea. The, of, maybe yeah. the the birds yeah. got to swim and the fish got to fly. But yeah. go ahead. Yeah, that's but hey, it works because patch faces is in in under the sea. The fish the fish fly and the birds swim. But yeah, like so, Euron's the antithesis of that. So the this idea of the Sakalia, this legend with the Raven Man, reminded me of. Euron and Victorian salt wife. But then there's the second story where same setup, the Raven Man spots the Sakaila woman. Only this time, the Sakaila woman becomes fed up with the Raven Man and she grips him in her tentacles and she holds him until the tide rises and she drowns him. And this reminded me of Asha and the role that she could play in Euron's downfall because even though Euron's going to be like our major third act villain and it's going to be John and Danny that have to really go at him, that is going to require some kind of ironborn support in order in order to make it, make it a success. Because once Euron's taken out, someone needs to lead the ironborn. And Asha, and it seems to be Asha and Theon, a joint endeavor of them coming together, Asha being... Uh, I've compared her to Cthulhu, the daughter of Cthulhu, and then, but then Theon being Theon the latecomer, and him being unable to sire children because of what Ramsay did to him, seems like they're going to be a joint rule where Theon will probably claim the crown, but in reality he's going to give it to, uh, he's going to um, abdicate and give it to Asha. I also think the whole idea of the of of this parallel with the crow man getting drowned by the 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 octopus woman could just mm -hmm. go back to the idea of Euron getting drowned and you know yeah. taken over by the deep ones in general. Yeah, which is the other thing we've talked extensively about Euron being the quintessential Lovecraft character. What always happens to them? They always get mind melted. So if Euron is going to drown, it's going to be drowning in his own consciousness when something when something bigger than him overtakes him. When a real god like figure, which is everything that he's against, actually plays puppet with him. So there's Shane is talking about uh, the Irish folklore and saying there's some precedent for you know, a brother of Sir Nunos being a Merlin King type. But again, leave me a comment in the video so I can uh, remember to follow up on that stuff. Uh, yes. So, okay. So, but we were originally talking about Ursula from the little mermaid yes. before I, before I went off into the Sakaila folklore. So Ursula Upcliffe, bride of the Merlin King makes sense just on the, the idea that Ursula is a sea witch name. Um, but it just shows you the Merlin King folklore is alive and well. And it implies that, you know, like some people have asked, what do the humans get for doing all this Deep Ones cult stuff? Is it all just manipulation and compulsory? Well, it's like the Squishers seem to have some super strength. But yeah, there could 
some of these drowned people also have the prophetic vision. So there's definitely room for like a woods witch or a sorcerer to be making pacts with the deep ones and gaining some sort of magic power, especially if George is copying the idea that they have, you know, a tie to Cthulhu or the stars or the comets or anything like that. So, yeah, Merlin King is a, is a position and a type of king, not a one figure, in my opinion. And that's why the legend is kind of everywhere. Now, let me... Uh, before we go to this drowned god stuff, which is related, um, and, and let me just give you a little bit about what this is going to be about, both you, Tim, and the chat. I have started to pick up on the idea that the drowned god, there's a bunch of different ideas that are lumped under the drowned god that may not all go together, okay? So on some level, the drowned god refers to the deep ones. They are the gods beneath the waves who are in control of all these people who get drowned. I'm glad you're having fun with the let the days go by with uh, all the talking. Yeah, I'm a big Talking Heads fan. I see it, Jenny. Water flowing underground. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, but where was I? Uh, with the Okay, so the Drowned God stuff. I think that there is some of the Drowned God ideas do not refer to the Deep Ones, and they do not refer to the Grey King, but something else. And so I am going, we're going to get into that in a minute. But before we get into that, because that's going to be a good chunk of, that'll, I think I want to close out the thing with that. Let's talk about Yeen a little bit. We are going to do a whole Sothorio stream sometime soon. However, I mentioned Yeen in the video, and so I want to follow up on this. Um, I've been saying for a while that I think Yin is built by the Deep Ones or Hybrid Thralls simply because it matches the construction style of Moat Kalen. The giant cottage-sized square blocks built out of black stone, stacked up really high in a swampy area. It's all the same. And nothing else matches those two. Like even a shy that's also said to be made out of oily stone, it doesn't have the description of Yin and Moat Kalen sort of fortress-like cities made out of big cyclopean megaliths. That's nothing like that is said about Ashai. So it's really Yin and Moat Kalen that seem like a match. And also both castles are so old, no one has any idea who built them. Moat Kalen is called yeah. a castle of the first men, but it's, it's not. Go ahead, Tim. So, because the other thing with Yin is it said that those, the black stone blocks it says that they're so heavy, it would require a dozen elephants to move them. Yeah. Which is something we never hear of in a shot. We're never given an idea of what, of Blackstone, the weight and size and all of all of that. So it makes you wonder, is there some kind of difference in it? Because if a shy is a city constructed entirely of this Blackstone, and it's so big that it can fit King's Landing, Volantis, and Old Town in it, but if the stone structures that it's built of are that heavy... Then that really makes you wonder, like, how, how could something that massive be built from such a super heavy material? Because Yin's built of it. Yin is smaller, but it seems to be different in that aspect, at least at least in the structure. Right. It's Yin and Moat Kalen are things that could have been built out of these weird megaliths. A shy potentially is different. Um Mm -hmm. Now, if Ashai was built and not transformed, then it would have been a Deep One city older than time. But I think that that theory, while it is appealing on its surface, does not mm -hmm. fit with all the various clues about transformation that are, that are at Ashai in the Shadowlands, some of which Tim highlighted in his video today. So, the key thing that I picked up is that... I, okay, so Isle of Toads has the black stone toad idol. It's 40 feet tall, so it's huge. Um, I would guess that it was not moved far. Uh, it was probably carved out of a rock that was on that island, one would guess. I mean, the Egyptians did float obelisks on down the river and stuff. Um, 
but the oily stone is it's you know it's not long and narrow like an obelisk it's a giant hunk like it would have been really hard to move far and then i discovered that there's a line about there being um ruined cities and fortresses on the other basilisk isles that the maesters think were also built by the people the toad island people the ancestors of the toad island people and so it doesn't say that it's oily stone but it probably is if it's black stone and it's the same built by the same civilization that worships the black stone toad idol the fact that the toad idol is so big says there probably is a repository of oily stone somewhere near there and the same thing with yin like yin was those blocks were quarried from somewhere so where mm -hmm. we don't know but potentially it would have been the Basilisk Isles because the Toad Isle is the Toad statue is so big that it probably wasn't moved. So what I'm seeing here is it's I feel like kind of dumb. It's like who built Yin? It was the Toad Island people. It was that same civilization that built all of these ruins that are all over the Basilisk Isles. So that just tells you the Fishman civilization here was once very big. It once covered all the basilisks and included Yin, which is up the river a bit. So I think this is, I think the, the other black stone ruins on the basilisks really help strengthen up the link between the Toad Island people and Yin. And we can now say, this is all part of the same civilization. So it's not a ruin older than time. It's as old as the Toad Idol and you know whatever else was going on there but we just how old was that who knows mm -hmm. let me bring up the map your thoughts tim yeah because as i say like that seems to be one of the key differences between yin being ruins and a shy being blighted because while a shy is definitely definitely blighted and poisoned and all and you know the 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 water contaminated and the land befouled it's not in ruins. The st the buildings are still standing, whereas Yin is in ruins. Something happened there. Something pushed the original civilization out, which makes that... And if that was a civilization that was able to build and move these blocks that require a dozen elephants just to move one, you're already looking at some kind of very either super strong or the very least super magical being that can that can use that as as building material so it's like well what defeated that and that's what makes sothorios even more scary and why the what's further south of the green hell is something we never want to mess with we already get stories of these giant apes that can kill an elephant with one punch so and the eyeless cave dwellers and the cannibal ghouls who even the brindled men are afraid of it's like, yeah, what what wiped out what wiped out the the original yin? It's probably something horrifying. Yeah, take your pick. I mean, there's a <laughs> lot of. I sometimes joke that Sothorius is is Bloodstone Emperor's island of Doctor Moreau, and that he was doing tons uh -huh. of experiments, and that's his experiments overran the island. And that's what happened. Um, but obviously, there like are lots of weird hybrids and monsters and stuff. So it's pretty, pretty. <laughs> It's not a good place to live. The thing I want to point out is that these black stone ruins are on the Isle of Tears, the Isle of Toads, and also Axe Isle. And Axe Isle is much further away. It's all the way on the other side of this Samatar Peninsula. Axe Isle is actually further from Gagasos than Yin is. So if a civilization was building on both Gagasos, Isle of Toads, and Axe Isle, it certainly could have included Yin and probably did. And probably original ruins of Zamatar, one would think. So this is a whole fish civilization here. And that's who built Yin. So that brings us to this question of the Black Stone. Okay. The main question here, let's so let's get back to Ashai. The reason why Ashai seems transformed. I mean, if you watch Tim's video, you won't have any doubt about it. But basically the fact that no no plants grow there except for ghost grass, 
Animals and children can't survive there. And the shadow binders that go the furthest up the river have to cover their faces and are probably deformed in some way. And Tim, you pointed out the statues from Ashai that Danny sees that are twisted and misshapen and horrible to look upon. So yeah. probably these shadow binders, something dark is going on under that mask. And this is a, obviously a magically toxic place. Now, my main argument about Ashai is because of the size. It's such a big city, far bigger than any city that is existent today. It could only have been built by a thriving civilization with lots of people and lots of money and lots of food. And you wouldn't build such a large city at the end of a blighted peninsula. You'd build it mm -hmm. at the tip of a rich peninsula with lots of resources to feed your empire. That's how the city would grow up and occur there naturally. So obviously it's overseeing mm -hmm. a trading, a key trading position with the Straits. But we can assume that at one point that whole peninsula wasn't all messed up because that's how you get a metropolis. Like the deep ones don't need to build a city that big and didn't do that anywhere else. And it doesn't make sense that only a few wizards and stuff would need a huge city either. It's got giant walls. So basically it really seems like it would have been built out of some other kind of stone. And in Tim's video, you can see that the meteor, the evil meteor in color out of space, literally leaches into the land. It does get into the stone, into the plants, into the water, into everything. It transforms yeah. everything. And then everything ends up gray and brittle at the end, whether it's plants or animals or people. When they die, it's this gray, brittle stuff. Um, and yeah. some of the plants particularly sound like ghost grass. And the point yeah, is, this, this entire gardener farm is transformed by the meteor. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, because uh, the skunk, that's why I brought up the line when I did my video, the skunk cabbages. The skunk cabbages are like the, the stand-in for ghost grass in the Lovecraft story. Or and the line versa. about, yeah. And the lot, well, the line is, what what's what's important is the line that's said about them, which is no healthy land would allow plants like that to grow. And then with Yin, like it said that Yin, uh, even the jungle, it, it remains untouched by the jungle. Everything's growing around it, but not in it. It's like the jungle is afraid to touch the black stone. And then in Colorado of Ashai, there's a comparable line about the blasted heath, how it's covered in a fine film of dust and ash. But it doesn't. But not even the wind will blow it. It's like these things are so unnatural that nature itself is afraid to touch it, and that's why, like with a shot that, and we see that with a shy. The only question is, like the that's why a shy being transformed into what it is rather than built also makes sense because, like I said with Yin, if it takes a dozen elephants to push one stone block, then you're not going to make a city out of that. Okay, that that'd be too. It's it's not a question of where he grips it. It's a question of weight ratio. Okay, you can't. You're not. That's not going to be the building material for your city. So it makes more sense. It makes more sense that a shy was once a thriving city, a good place to live, and something happened to it to blight it and make it what it is today. The same way that Nahum Gardner's farm was once a nice successful little farm with a nice little family that lived on it that bad things happened to when this meteor hit you're muted and then the other thing is that there is a parallel with all the places that are like the moon that gave birth to dragons the, mm -hmm. the fire moon if you will there's a bunch of places any place that is a home of dragons is the easiest way to say it, has the same thing going on. Valeria is a home of dragons. What happened to it? It exploded. Okay. The dragon pit in King's Landing used to be a home of dragons. What happened to it? It got destroyed. It got caved in. And in fact, one of the dragons trying to get out of the dragon pit cracked its head on the dome and caused the cave in. So literally like a dragon hatching out of an egg trying to poke its head out of the cracked shell. 
So just like the moon being like an egg and giving birth to dragons. So a shy oh, yeah. is the original home of dragons, and I'll let you go in a second. And so, yeah, it would fit the pattern if it similarly was blown up, transformed, and particularly in a way that is connected to the moon apocalypse. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I just saw the comment from Eldrick Stoneskin. What if they were carried by two African swallows? Okay, two, two soft Yori swallows, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> they are bigger. Two yeah. wyverns, maybe. <clears throat> I don't think soft Yori swallows migrate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, let's see, where were we? Yeah, so all for all these reasons, I'm pretty sure that a shy is transformed. Now, it could mm -hmm. be that Yin and the Toad idled all this oily stone, all of it comes from a shy. That is one possibility. And that would mean that Yin and this squisher stuff isn't quite as old as we're thinking. It's all that would mean it was post or during the long night that this stuff would have been built. And that's possible. That's still like 8,000 years ago. That's long enough to vanish into the fog of time and be older than anyone remembers. Um, but it could be that there are cycles of meteors. There is evidence for this as well. Okay. Um, the, the great empire of the dawn people in Danny's vision have pale swords of fire that sound like dawn. And these are the gemstone emperors that came before the bloodstone emperor. The Bloodstone Emperor also is a corrupter who is twisting everything that is, comes before him. And so he's got a black meteor. It's very possible that that pearl palanquin that the Pearl Emperor was all about was the meteor that Dawn is made from, a pale stone meteor of the Dawn legend. Um, also, the whole dragons thing, like the Great Empire of the Dawn had dragons before the Long Night too because they're making fused stone and stuff like that. So, also, why did they make the five forts? Like, were there already demons coming out of the Grey Waste before the Long Night? The Long Night's when the others first appeared, we think. But the five forts and, and the stuff there implies there was already a previous cycle of magical demons invading. So, mm -hmm. it kind of makes more sense that there has been multiple meteor strikes as opposed to just this one that caused the Long Night and if the long night moon meteors were magic, and if the comet is magic, then probably every meteor impact is magic. So what I am guessing that Martin is implying is that this squisher stuff with Yin and the sea stone chair is from a previous cycle. And when the moon meteors fell and the bloodstone emperor did his thing, he might have been tapping into that deep one magic or something like that. That was like already been used before. Yeah, because, um, okay, for example, like when it comes to these ancient cities, um, if we take everyone at their word, then everyone's the most ancient city. And, but we get another example out in the far east and it sits on the wrong side of the five forts, so to speak. Another one of these whole scale ripped straight from Lovecraft things, and that is Kadoth. Kadoth is the only city in the Grey Waste, and George, they and the inhabitants claim that they're the oldest city, that the city has always existed and always will exist. Kadoth is taken straight from the the Dreamlands in Lovecraft, and just as George puts his Kadoth in the Grey Waste, which is a frozen desert, Lovecraft's Kadoth lays in the cold waste past the. Uh, uh uh past past i'm blanking on the i just did i did stream quest of unknown kadoth uh the pillar of flame which is like a stand-in for the five forts so he's like whole scale ripping more more lovecraft here and so like yeah when it comes to this stuff like who has a pact with the deep ones where's this black stone coming from it seems like they they've had made anchor points all over the place. So when you ask the question of like we're bat we're before the five forts constructed, if there were already demons and stuff out there, well, if we take Kadoth at their word at it, then it seems like yeah, seems like there was already scary stuff all the way out there to begin to begin with. And 
and the five forts being built become a response to that. Fused Dragonstone becomes a more workable building material than the oily black stone that these Lovecraftian things are working with. Muted again. I think that could be the case at Old Town, as I said, where the tunnels remind Archmaester Theron of the sea stone chair. I think that's oily stone at the base that's been shaped with dragon fire on top to make the fortress. But I think that is a big oily stone rock, which is cool because it's probably bigger than the Toad Idol, and it's sitting right there in Old Town, a giant hunk of oily black stone. So... This is another thing to keep an eye on when Euron does his whatever he's doing at Old Town. Um, he might, I, I would love to see him go down into those tunnels. Where, by the way, the first High Towers lived. Very suspicious. Um, so, uh, let's see, what did I, what did I, I had a couple, oh yes. So, okay. Another line of symbolism that implies that a shy is transformed, and this will get us into the shade of the evening trees, is this idea of squid ink. Okay, so Tim is making a comparison. In the color out of space, the well seems to be the center of the corruption that they came from this mm. meteor because people jumped into the well and the water In got the defiled. And it's leaching into the land from the well. And then the color energy comes out of the well at the end. Um, mm -hmm. So this, the parallel would be the river Ash. And you can made a direct comparison the, that flows out of Stygi. And it's, of course, phosphorescent green at night. And there's only deformed fish in it. And you can't drink it unless you're a shadow binder or a fool, like Patchface, Drowned Man. Um, and so Tim's theory, which I think is very strong is that essentially the poison meteor is sitting in Stygi, which is something I've been saying for years. The poison meteor is in Stygi. It is probably a shrine built around the meteor. And with the river flowing from those mountains, it is carrying the corruption throughout the peninsula and the land, just as the well is leaching into the land. Okay, now... Sea stone chair is oily black stone. It's carved in the shape of a squid. What do squids do? They squirt black ink into the water. So I just said the river ash, phosphorescent green by night, but it's the river is black water. It's the black river ash. It glows green at night, but it's a black river. So is there an oily black stone at the mouth of the river turning it black? shooting its squid ink, so to speak, into the river. It's like, yeah, this the squid animal ink symbolism helps sew it up. You see what I'm saying? Like, if there mm -hmm. is a black stone in Stygi poisoning the river, then it is doing the squid thing. It is a squid squirting magic black ink into the river and thereby the whole peninsula. So that's really cool because, of course, you have to remember... The sea stone chair was first in the story before a shy was built out of oily stone or any other greasy or oily stone was mentioned. It was the sea stone chair. So that was George's first idea about oily stone. In a way, all the other oily stone is just world building out the sea stone chair. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the sea stone chair being a squid rock is a very important part of what's going on. And I just love how your theory about Stygi and the river Ash fits in with that idea of a squid rock turning it black. Mm -hmm. There's also, uh, along with the squid stuff, there's also a lot of heart stuff because we've talked about the heart of winter and the heart of darkness and Stygi pro possibly being the heart of darkness. When we think of rivers being the lifeblood of cities, how I had said like most major cities are, bu are built either on coasts or on major rivers, and Ashai is no exception because it's at the mouth and the tail end of the Ash River where it empties out into the Jade Sea. And the Ash River further up north, when it starts up in the Mountains of the Morn, it's actually a tributary. It for So there's two paths that fork, and they come to meet in the, in the Vale of Shadows 
that's where they come together, but that's also where Stagai is. So that's where the water meets and becomes corrupted at this point. Now, right. the Veil of Shadows is so narrow that light only that sunlight can only be seen there for one hour otherwise 23 hours out of the day it's cloaked in complete darkness because of how how narrow the valley is and how high the cliffs are well thinking of this as a if we're thinking of this in terms of a heart of rivers being the lifeblood this is a narrow artery to the heart of darkness that is the ash river and that is why it's like the light, the water is corrupted. It's literally like the lifeblood of Ashai is being corrupted. And it happens at Stagai. Stagai is the focal point where the corruption happens. Okay, so put a pit in this real quick. There's a chat comment. Eldrick Stoneskin pointing out a line about a singer from Old Town, Orland of Old Town, who played the high harp and sang of dead kings beneath the sea. That's cool. Just another little... Bit of folklore of kings under the water, Merlin kings, if you will. Um, so with the squid and the ink, I think that, so shout out to Disputed Lands. You guys know I love the Disputed Lands and Crow Foods Daughters theories. We have matching but opposite theories about the shade trees, okay? she Her theory, and I'm just summing it up, so check out her video, but uh, her theory is that the oily black stone is petrified shade tree wood. So just as mm -hmm. the weirwoods turn to pale stone, if the, if the shade trees are like the weirwoods, then they might petrify and turn into black stone. And of course, the shade drink itself is oily. It has an oily taste and viscosity to it. Um, and a lot of the same words are used for the oily stone. It drinks the light. Um, the, the building, uh, the, the undying house of the undying also drinks the light. So there's a lot of symbolic language that's common between the shade trees and the oily stone. So Amanda's theory is that the oily stone is petrified shade wood, which I like on its own, but conflicts with some of my head cannons. So I was thinking about it and I was thinking about Tim's theory and I was thinking about the Grey King and how the, it seems like the Grey King is sailing a weirwood boat to the Iron Islands. And I'm like, okay, we've got a mystery here. Either the Grey King actually made the boat in Westeros on the Iron Islands and just took it out sailing and eventually beached it there. And it's not the boat that he's sailed across the sea from. However, I think that it is the boat that he sailed across the sea from because the whole thing about this boat is that it's huge. It's like an ark. The, 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 the beams, the Nagas ribs, which are the hull of the boat, are twice as tall as a Droman's mast. So this is a boat that's twice as big overall. Well, more than that by volume, but then a Droman, which is a big ship. So... We're talking about a very, very big ship. And that seems like an ark. That seems like the kind of thing you would sail from across the sea. Grey King also, like, we've established the Iron Islands are full of squisher hybrids. The Ironborn hate weirwoods. The Grey King is the only person that's doing all this weirwood stuff. And so I think the boat, well, I'm going to save my boat theory. That's, that's getting too far afield. But the point is, if he sailed in a weirwood boat from a shy, that means there used to be weirwoods in a shy. And there are, the more I thought about it, the more reasons I have to think that that is the case. And so here, what I think is going on is that the, un, the shade trees are mutated, corrupted weirwood trees. They have been corrupted by the oily black stone. So think about Tim's theory. If there's an oily stone in Stygi, leaching into the river ash in such a way that it poisons the entire peninsula and turns the stone into oily stone. What would happen to weirwood trees that were growing there? They would be mutated too, maybe killed, but maybe that's how we got the shade of the evening trees. We only see the shade trees in Karth. 
Now, maybe this map of Olthos means there's a bunch of shade trees. And this is what Amanda's pointing at, is that this is a whole continent of shade trees here. It's hard to tell. It, do, it does look like that. But it's just, we have nothing about Olthos except for this picture. So maybe that's what Amanda's saying, that all the petrified trees come from there. What I'm saying is that all these shade trees on Olthos and that probably used to be on the Shadowlands, they would have been transformed by this meteor strike. And that is why all the oily language is similar. Okay. And so this makes sense. Now you've got the green king, you got the gray king rather. He leaves a shy because it's corrupted. And so he takes some of these last weirwoods and builds a boat out of them. And then what does he do when he gets to Westeros? He flips the boat back over and plants it on the ground. So I actually think that it's possible that he reactivated the weirwood ribs of the boat, which he planted like trees and was using that weirwood in Westeros. Because of course he's sitting on a weirwood throne and um, using green seer magic. So I think that he's bringing the green seer magic from a shy. So that's, that's my whole theory about that is that, yeah, the shade trees are transformed weirwoods and the transformation comes from the meteor sitting in Stygi. And I think that also parallels perfectly Azor High as the dragon who invades the weirwood net and transforms it because he's kind of like the meteor. So yeah, you guys can hear Cleo. Let me go get her jazz and uh, uh, Tim talk about the shade trees or whatever for like a half a second. A couple sure. minutes. Okay, yeah, because I've talked with, I've mentioned this too, where like, yeah, Garth and Grey King, if this if they're replanting weirwoods, it's kind of like they got that Johnny Appleseed aspect to them of we got to take these trees that are dying in our land. They can't grow there correctly anymore and we'll find a new home for them in Westeros. If weirwoods are originally native, to far east essos and westeros becomes their new home their last saving their last saving grace but then it also makes me wonder like just how fickle weirwoods can be because if weirwoods now th now this is something that happens in nature when you have like a disaster sometimes you'll have some species will die out other species will overcome and adapt they might change features but they'll come to live in the new land or the new world that they're living in and that could be the shade trees being weirwoods who have be like, okay, overcome and adapt. Now we got to live in this blighted land. But then you remember things like weir, but weirwoods don't won't grow in the Iron Islands because the so the soil's too loose and stony, and they won't grow in the Vale for the exact same reasons. So I don't know the the idea of shade trees. It what makes me wonder: are they weaker or even more hardier than uh, weirwoods if they're growing? if they're still growing out there. But like you said, they, we only ever see them in Karth. We don't actually know if shade trees are growing in a shy because we're led to believe that nothing's growing in a shy save for ghost grass. But then even in the world of ice and fire, when they talk about the gold, they say that the gold is just as cursed as the fruit that grows there, which does imply that it's not that nothing grows in a shy. It's just that very little grows in a shy food is scarce mute it the fact it just occurred to me the fact that the gold is messed up that tells you the stone can be corrupted like gold is a metal so if the mm -hmm. meteor corrupting everything in a shy is even corrupting the gold in the rock then it's corrupting the rock itself mm -hmm. so yes this this really speaks to that um so yeah, I think I think there's a lot more to this. The idea that uh, Grey King is is a weirwood green seer already fleeing from the Great Empire of the Dawn. So let's expand on this a little bit since we're talking about it. The Far Winds live on the Lonely Light, which is eight days out west from the rest of the Iron Islands. Eight days sail. Lonely light. There it is. So, I think, and I have explained why, but I think that 
this was not settled by Ironborn, who eventually wandered out there and found the Lonely Light, but rather by the Grey King's Mariners stopping there first when they came from the West. Uh, because that's what would have happened. Uh, when you're getting close to land, you see the seabirds, you follow them. That's how, like, you might wonder, like, oh, how do people find these small little islands? Well, like, the currents of the seabirds will take you there once you get close. So if they're sailing towards the Iron Islands, they're going to run into the Lonely Light. It's, it's pretty big. It's as big as Pike. Um, and there's a bunch of smaller islands around it. So it's like a whole little thing out there. And the, the, um, the far winds are very strange. Gilbert Farwind went at the King's Moot. There's two things about him. One, he speaks about a land across the Sunset Sea. So he's, he, those places alone have a memory of that, which is a clue that they are original descendants of, that, of the Great Empire of the Dawn, Ironborn, who came here. And then he's got color-changing eyes. Like, Aaron looks at them and observes that, yes, they do change colors. So changing color eyes, that's not something we see anywhere else. However, we know that green seers have unique eye colors, and the Great Empire of the Dawn people are known for their gemstone-colored eyes, which are a lot of the gems they're using are very multicolored, shifty gems like opal, uh, tourmaline comes in a bunch of different colors. Um, uh, pearl is a, you know, kind of shiny, luminescent thing that's got a bunch. I mean, it's mostly gray, but still, it's iridescent. So, yeah, it could be that the color changing eyes is, I mean, at the very least, we could say it's probably a sign of magic. And one mm. of the rumors about the Far Winds is that maybe they skin change seals and whales and walruses and stuff. So, you put all that together. And it really seems like these far winds are remnants. They are more original. They have interbred less with first men from Westeros, and they retain a closer connection to the original people that came from the Great Empire of the Dawn, and they seem to be skin changers with magic eye color. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, because if they are skin changers, if they're skin changing seals and walruses, and especially if they're skin changing the spotted whales that are out there, that would be allowing them to swim pretty far out and be able to scout out some of this stuff, which could be an indication of why Gilbert Farwin is so convinced that if they sail west that they're going to find something. They are very tall. Good call, Jacob. That's right. The Farwins are all described as tall, which could be a Great Empire of the Dawn thing. Eldrick Stoneskin, Stoneskin says, Gilbert, Gil like a fish. <laughs> and I would let Bert like Qbert. Um, so that's cool. Are these the people with the nettle crest? No, no, they're not. The sigil for the far winds is a silhouetted ship against a sunset, which is the picture of a boat sailing from the west um, to you. So... Um, so that's one part, okay, of the idea that the Grey King was a green seer and a skin changer before he came to Westeros. Now, if he's a green man, which I, a lot of the original green seers would have been green men, then this, again, fits the Durin God's Grief pattern and fits this pattern of this sea king who appears to be like a green man. So that could be part of it. Like the original Merlin King, they were green men who got hybridized. Um, let me see. Oh, gosh. So many things to think about. Okay, so... The... Okay, the old ones from Lang. If... So this, this is sort of the missing ingredient here. Another reason to think the Great Empire of the Dawn were green seers are this, this whole thing about the old ones from Lang. Remember, the Langi are tall. They've got medium golden brown skin and golden eyes that are large and can see in the dark. You got black hair. And they are probably related to the old ones. And so you follow the clues, and it's like, oh, the old ones are like tall children of the forest, potentially. And that's why they're half-human descendants. 
have these large glowing eyes that sound like children of the forest eyes. And of course, the old ones live in caves like the children of the forest. Now, the thing is the old ones, of course, come from Lovecraft too. Mm -hmm. And Isle of Lang is from Lovecraft. And on mm -hmm. Lovecraft's Lang are horny goat people. They are not the old ones, but they worship the old ones. They are the men of Lang, just like the men of Ib. So the Langi men, they're goat horned people. I've used their pictures a bunch of times. But depending on how much George is copying, it appears that his Lang has green men on it, which instead of horny goat people, they're like horny deer people. But it's the same Kernunos mythology. Okay? So... If the old ones on Lang are green men, as I am very sure they are, check out my secret origins of the green men, Isle of Lang. Then I, I basically said we've got two possibilities. Either the green men come from Lang and came to Westeros from Lang, or they existed in both places and the old ones on Lang are just a surviving pocket. I used to think that was more likely, but now I think that all the, the green men come from Lang. And that means the Great Empire of the Dawn, because Lang was part of the Great Empire of the Dawn. Also, Lang called the Holy Isle of Lang. Isle of Faces is a holy isle, and the Iron Islands are called Holy Islands. So those are your three Holy Islands. Lang, Isle of Faces, and the Iron Islands. So, basically... If green seers are coming from the Great Empire of the Dawn, that probably has something to do with the green men of Lang. Um, and again, you, you think of the god empresses of Lang and the god emperors of the Great Empire of the Dawn and how that implies that the royalty of Lang is tied into, by marriage, the royalty of the Great Empire of the Dawn. So that's how you get Great, great Empire of the Dawn green men and green seer kings from the old ones. So that's how your far winds are green seers. That's how gray king's a green seer. That's how he's sailing to Westeros on a weirwood boat. And that's why we start to theorize about, oh, there used to be weirwoods on a shy, but they got transformed. And that's why the gray king fled with a weirwood boat, is to save some weirwoods from there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, yeah, just to finish up, just... The ones that stayed on a shy, the weirwoods that were there, I think would have turned into shade of the evening trees. Yeah, and because Lang is another one of these examples, just like Ib, of George taking the idea whole scale, breaking it up into multiple pieces, and then repurposing it. Because the original Lang from Lovecraft is a plateau. Uh, it sits next to a place called the Cold Waste, which is where the city, the right. dreamland city of Kadath is. And there's also a place in, in the cold ways called the giant's quarry where they mine black onyx. Now, George, now we just take these things. We do the split. George takes the name Lang. He makes it his jungle Island by E.T. with his eight foot tall children of the forest people. But all the other ideas stay the same because Kadath sits on a plat. His Kadath sits on a plateau. Mm -hmm. It's in the gray waste, which is frozen, and right. all of that sits. And all of that sits right next to the five forts, ah. which are fused black stone. So the five forts are like the giant's quarry. It's like every everything is taken, recycled, re and repurposed in a different area, and that's like the thing. The further east we go the more Lovecraftian it gets. And that's why it stands out to me that the Pearl Emperor, who's the first of these hybrid emperors, is the one to supposedly raise the five forts to try and keep out all of the very far eastern scary things. Right, so it's kind of like they're there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, and thank you for the super chat, Jacob. I appreciate you. Um... Okay, so that I think is the picture of what's going on. I've got more, I'll have more to say about this. Oh, the last thing was, yeah. So the men of Lang in Lovecraft, these goat horned men of Lang, they are known as traders and they sail ships all over the mm -hmm. place. In fact, 
They even sail ships to the moon. To the moon. Shout out Radiohead, Sail to the Moon. I'm not even going to sing it. It's too slow, but awesome song. In any case, if the old ones of Lang, the green men, old ones of Lang, if they sail boats, we shouldn't be surprised. If they sailed boats to Westeros, we shouldn't be surprised because the men of Lang, who worship the old ones in Lovecraft, are traders and sailboats. So that is part of it also. I do think the Green Men are not original to Westeros, and I think they came there. And a lot of people have been begging me to say this for years. That like Garth the Green is the Emerald Emperor, and he is a Great Empire of the Dawn Emperor or something like that. And I won't go that far, but I'll definitely say that I do think Garth the Green, who represents the coming of the Green Men to Westeros, I do think he comes from the Great Empire of the Dawn. I do. Yeah. Well, I think like what makes it interesting is that with Lovecraft, occasionally you have you have your characters who actively make packs with entities like the Deep Ones, usually for some kind of, if not for personal gain, then for some kind of gain that they see as the greater good. That's Shadow, Shadow over Innsmouth. Uh, when the pact is made with the Deep Ones, it's played off as it's for the good of the entire town because it's not just uh, it's not just Marsh making himself rich; he's making the town rich. But then when the when he dies and the people find out what kind of pact was made, they're like, "No, that's terrible. We shouldn't have gone through with this." Occasionally, you will get that Lovecraft character who realizes that, like, no. You shouldn't be messing with this stuff. You shouldn't be making packs with these things. Like the rewards are never going to be worth the uh, the price that you pay. We kind of see that's why I see like with Pearl Emperor being the person who raises the five forts and sort of builds this wall to separate the Lovecraft stuff. He kind of seems like that character who recognizes that we shouldn't be messing with these things. We shouldn't be making deals with these types of things but then bloodstone emperor but then further down the line we get bloodstone emperor who's like no i am gonna mess with it i am gonna worship the black stone we're going we're bringing it back we're bringing it all back and then that's kind of where uh and then euron plays in a part with this euron doesn't believe in gods but he's definitely treading into the territory of godhood to become one whereas john John is probably going to be brought back. Well, he's definitely going to be brought back. The problem is the one would hope it's the question of how is he going to be brought back? Because I've talked about G John has a lot of Jesus allegory to him. And what happens with the second coming of Jesus? He's coming back and he ain't going to be happy. If John is come, if John comes back, but let's say something like it's the burning of Shireen that brings him back. He's going to be angry. He's going to be angry that that's the price that they paid. John, because even though it's necessary for John to come back, he's going to, if he, if that's what it takes to bring him back, he's going to carry that weight. And that goes back to the conversation that uh, Davos has with Stannis about what's the price of one bastard boy against the kingdom. And Davos says everything. When we were talking like Azor Ahai stabbing Nissa Nissa, that killing your wife, even if it's done for the greater good, the fact that it caused you to kill somebody or to make this dark deal means that it probably wasn't worth it. Bringing John back is necessary, but that doesn't mean that John's not going to question the validity of it. And why did you bring it, John? I, I missed something. Why are we talking about John? I was talking. I was talking about the uh, the idea of pat of Pax. And deals made with these love with these love these love crafty and deal deals that get made and the how how worth it they really are how people respond to them. Gotcha. Okay, I think I got distracted by the chat right in the middle of that, and I came back and you were talking about John. And I just I was like, what? How? What happened? Yeah. <laughs> but yes, that's this, that's the kind of theme that is. That's why I compared the others and the deep ones. Like making packs with the Fey is the overarching mm -hmm. category of what we're talking about here. It works the same pretty much everywhere. Anyone's making any kind of pact with the magical force. So real quick, I just want to say 
Um, there was a question about whether or not people are allowed to mention other channels or other videos in the chat. Yes, of course you can. Um, there's a couple of channels I don't love, but I'm not going to get offended. We're all here to talk about ice and fire. If somebody, even channels that I quote unquote don't care for or something, they will have a theory that's good. And you guys can just don't worry about any of that. Have fun. Yeah. Talk about whatever theories that you want to talk about. Um, I guess it's obnoxious if you brought up somebody else's theory and try to take over the chat when I'm talking about something different. But for the most part, you guys bring up uh, other videos and theories that are related to what we're talking about. So yeah, have fun. I'm not uptight about that. Um, I don't think, I don't see us YouTube channels as being in competition. If my channel does well, then it's like pumping up interest in Ice and Fire. And that means Tim's channel is going to do a little better. And if, mm -hmm. and if someone has a theory that's the opposite of mine about Great Empire of the Dawn or the Kings of Winter or anything else, then that just stirs up interest. They might want to come back to my video and see what I said about it. So yeah, I'm not uptight about that. And uh, I'm just here to facilitate, all of us are um, here to facilitate everyone's enjoyment of the material, first and foremost. That's what we're doing. So yeah, just not order the green hand. Other than that, so it's, oh, but yeah, still, not, it's fine. Not, if, they, if they have a new theory that we need to talk about, that's fine too. We you never know. need to talk about an ook theory. They're never good. Not usually, no. <laughs> ook. <laughs> okay. Ook. So let's, so I've got a few of these. We don't need to hit all these quotes, but I've got some. I pulled every quote about the drowned god and I organized mm -hmm. them here. And there's a few of them that I just want to highlight. Some, a lot of them are just saying stuff we already know. But there's a couple things here that jumped out with me. Jumped out to me. So, um, so the Grey King and the Drowned God, definitely not the same person. There's a couple lines that are interesting. It says, talking about Naga, it says mm -hmm. the Grey King had slain her and the Drowned God had changed her bones to stone. So that's interesting. There's two people there or two things. Grey King is the one who s slew the Sea Dragon, but he's working on behalf of the Drowned God. Okay. And then later it says after the Grey King had lived a thousand years, he descended to the Drowned God's watery halls to take his place at his right hand. Now that is language borrowed from the Bible. And that essentially implies the gray king as a Jesus to the drowned gods, God the Father. Okay, now in the biblical trinity, the idea is that Jesus is God incarnated as a man. Just like the squishers need to make hybrids in order to rule the land, God the Father stays in heaven. And so he made an emanation of himself a kind of sort of who is born in into a human body and that's Jesus. So when he's done with his earthly life, he ascends back to heaven because that's where he came from. He's really just a slice of God, the father, an aspect of God, the father, and then the Holy spirit, the third part of the Trinity, that is the spirit of God that can live in our heart. So kind of like the prickle fish that connects you to the drunk God, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and connects you to God in heaven. So that's how the Trinity works. And so when George is borrowing from that language, he's implying the gray king as a human emanation of the drowned God. But we know that's not exactly right. The gray king is a green seer who comes from across the sea and marries a mermaid and gets inculcated into all this stuff. But he is not really an emanation of the drowned god. That is that is not quite right. Um, but he's definitely seen as being separate, at least. That much we can tell. A similar line. Uh, the Grey King wears a crown of driftwood so that all who knelt before him might know his kingship came from the sea and the drowned god who dwells beneath it. So one, the thing I want to drill in on here is the drowned god is first. He is original, and he is more powerful. The Grey King comes to the Iron Islands 
and wields the authority of the drowned god by putting on floppy ears of the drowned god. He marries a mermaid, which means a, a, a hybrid first man woman, because the first men on the Iron Islands are already hybridized before Grey King gets there. I think that's very clear. So he marries a mermaid woman. He he's, sits in a, uh, a throne of uh, Mother of Pearl in one story. He's got a driftwood crown. So he's taking on all this aquatic imagery to rule these fishy people. But he himself is a green seer from across the sea. All right. The drowned god, so that makes sense. The drowned god is some figure that's tied, and this is the point I want to make, tied to the, the Deep One First Man culture. Before Grey King ever shows up, and before that phase of Ironborn history ever happens, the Ironborn are hybridized, they have Deep One's cult, and they are worshipping the drowned god. Would you agree with that so far, Tim? Yeah. And it, because with the Deep Ones, I guess if we were to look at what the Holy Trinity of the Deep Ones would be, it would be Cthulhu, Dagon, and then the hybrid spirit. Um, Jesus being the son of God, Jesus is a man, but he's like a very special man. Dagon, uh, in in the original Lovecraft story, Dagon, Dagon is, is a, basically a Deep One. He's just a very giant, special Deep One, which is why the smaller more common deep ones tend to follow him as some kind of leader but he's not the end-all be-all he's not on the same level as cthulhu or nyarlahotep or the other god-like levels that we we would associate uh he just dagan just happens to be just a very special deep one in that sense <laughs> and but but dagan becomes a very common name among ironborn especially like now we get Dagon Cod, who is our one of our Deep One stanzins to really cement home like that this stuff is really going on. But then even bigger than him, one of the biggest, one of the great prides of Ironborn is Dagon Greyjoy, the last Reaver. Usually the date if, if the name Dagon is being bestowed upon a character, George is doing it with very specific intent. There's something about them that he wants to highlight by giving them that name. Which is, yeah, and then, yeah, and obviously the name Dagon, it, it, like we said, it, it implies a lot. But the main thing it implies is a connection to the Deep Ones and stone idols and things like that, and fish people. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, the Drowned God is some sort of pre-Grey King figure, okay? Now, like I said, in some of the passages, the Drowned God is really the Drowned Gods, and it's really the deep ones down there, okay? So the Grey, the um, the Ironborn believe that they are created by the deep ones. There's a lot about that. We came from beneath those seas, says Sauron Saltung, from the watery halls of the drowned god who made us in his likeness and gave us dominion over the waters of the earth. So the original Ironborn are made in the likeness of the drowned god. So this is, again, talking about the Deep Ones and the fact that they are hybridized and that their fathers are Deep Ones. The Drowned God makes men, Old King Euron Redhand said once, but it's men who make crowns. So the Drowned God makes men. The Drowned, had, drowned God had made them to reeve and rape, to carve out kingdoms. We are the Ironborn, sons of the sea, chosen of the Drowned God. Sons of the sea, so born from the sea, reborn from the sea, you get the idea. Now, the drowned god, yes, he's described as the creator of the seas and the father of the ironborn. Interestingly, there are no idols carved in his likeness. There is the sigil of House Botley. Is it Botley? No. Sunderly with the um the drowned man is and and Euron describes the drowned god as a match to the sin, sigil a drowned man with broken limbs and fish nibbling at him okay yeah and that's what makes it important that Euron is part his mother was a sunderly Balon, Victarion, Damper and Euron their mother is a sunderly so 
symbolically, they are all drowned men, as well as Krakens. So basically what I'm saying is that part of the truth of the drowned god is the drowned man, and part of it is the Deep One Fathers. Both ideas are merged together. There must have been a first hybrid, a first drowned prophet, a first hybrid king, a first Merlin king, if you will. And that, that person was probably the, considered the drowned god. Like So check this out. Lord God who drowned for us, let Meldred, your servant, be born again from the sea. So the Deep Ones didn't drown. Like they, the Deep Ones live underwater. Mm-hmm. Who is the, the God that drowned for them? Again, that's Jesus language. Lord God who died for us. That's a common prayer that you pray to Jesus. Thank him for dying for us. It's a nice thing that he did. So Yeah, now eat your cracker. <laughs> eat your cracker, drink your grape juice. <laughs> drink your wine and eat your cracker. So who so how does that make sense? Who is a figure that drowned for the ironborn? Well, it's the figure on the sigil. It's the first hybrid that that drowned and passed the drowning test and was reborn from the sea as a successful deep one hybrid that could live on land or water. So part of this drowned god mythology refers to the first Merlin king or kings of the Ironborn. And that's where we get back to these sigils. Look at the sigil. It's a dude with a green beard. And the same with the Merlin king from White Harbor. So is it possible these first... Um, these first ironborn who were getting hybridized, were they green men with green hair already? Because the first first men are spelled out as the children of Garth, right? All these houses in the Reach are related to Garth the Green. They're all descended from Garth the Green, which implies they're green men. And then they're spreading throughout Westeros. So I'm just wondering if part of this green-haired, Merlin King thing is talking about green men who were hybridized. And Grey King steps right into that, being a green seer who married a mermaid. So he's kind of like just participating in the tradition that's already going on. Yeah. Do you do you have that artwork handy of Grey King and his mermaid wife from the calendar? You know I do. Does she have hair? Because the Thousand Islanders are the ones who have definitely been the most squisher farmed. They have the green tinged skin, but not hair. But if we get an idea, if we can see her, if she looks more like she a Thousand Islanders. She does seem to have hair. Okay. She got some ropey. She, Gosh, the mermaids are pretty. Um, but she also definitely has that Thousand Islander look. So Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. The green, green tinged skin and the green hair. Yeah, possibly. Uh, at least with the Thousand Islanders, they have they definitely have the skin, but not the hair to lend validity to it's that. It's just a dope wig she puts on when she comes on land to not freak people out. That's all it is. She just takes it off and mm. swims. Because you wouldn't want all that hair swimming underwater. She's definitely kind of Lilith looking. Oh, she's covered by... Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Thank you. Sorry. I'm looking at the wrong oh, okay. screen. I didn't see that it was covered. There you go. Thank you, chat. There she is. Oh, she's got she's got her hair styled in that way where you can see a lot of prominent forehead. That's why it was making me think of that. That maybe yes. That's why I said maybe it's just a a headpiece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, back to these quotes about the drowned god. So, is somebody that drowned for everyone? That's that's what's interesting. And let's see, there's some more stuff about, oh yeah, the drowned priests. Some priests eat only fish and only bathe in the sea. I thought that was interesting. That's a very like, the first drowned priests are strong hybrids and they only want to eat fish. Like that's, that's interesting. And then it says men from the other lands often think them mad and so they may appear. So these are just more quotes playing up the idea that these drowned priests are very patch face like they are crazy. Like they're all crazy (laughs) because they're really drowned and controlled by the deep ones. So this is just me sort of 
fleshing out the Aaron God patch face theory there. Um, but over and over, they also refer to the drowned God being the one who decides who sits the sea stone chair. So it's like the whole role of the drowned priest is definitely to translate the will of the beings under the sea, whoever that is. Okay, read those, read those. So this is one of the ones that got me started on this mystery. A sign it is, the priest said, and they're looking at the comet. Let me get rid of this, hang on. A sign it is, but from our God, not theirs. A burning brand it is, such as our people carried of old. It is the flame the drowned God brought from the sea, and it proclaims a rising tide. It is time to hoist our sails and go forth into the world with fire and sword as he did. So there's a lot here. First of all, the red comet, a sign from the drowned god, kind of fits because Cthulhu is tied to the stars and shit. Even though you said um, the, the, the red star of Aldeneb, he is in opposition to Cthulhu, right? Yeah, the, yeah but they all... They all come from the scar because that's the thing to remember about these Lovecraftian gods. Like we got to put gods in quotation marks because the end, well, the reality is, is that they're all extraterrestrials, and it's possible that wherever they came from, they might not actually be anything special, but they seem very god. It's to humanity is what they seem very godlike too. And so, right, that's like, that literally could be true, that the Deep Ones are serving an entity that is tied to the Red Comet. That could be a thing. Then, mm -hmm. a burning brand it is, such as our people carried. It is the flame the drowned god brought from the sea. So, what is this flame that the drowned god brought from the sea? The Deep Ones don't bring fire out of the sea. They don't bring torches out of the sea. You can't do that anyway. Patchface does talk about under the sea the flames burn black and purple and green or something. Um, but this has always been a mystery so, uh, for two reasons. One, what is the fire and who is this guy carrying stuff out of the sea? So my main idea about this is that this is about the sea stone chair and that the idea of it being fire is tied to the idea that it is a meteor that has magic because the fire of the gods is anything that's the magic of the gods. And a meteor bringing magic from outer space obviously is the fire of the gods, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you bring a meteor out of the sea, you're bringing the fire of the gods out of the sea. We think that the Deep Ones or their servants were the ones that brought the, deep, the sea stone chair out of the water, as you saw in all my little animations of them leaving it there on the shore. So I think that the drowned god, referring to either the deep ones or the first hybrids, literally brought the sea stone chair out of the sea. And that is the fire of the drowned god. And so then it makes sense that Aaron is pointing at the comet, which of course is tied to oily stone and the meteorites, and saying that is the fire the drowned god brought out of the sea. Because the oily black stone is either a meteorite or it's meteor transformed stone. So it's it, it, there's a strong connection between the oily stone and the comet. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any other yeah. ideas about the fire out of the sea? Yeah, because that would make the most sense to me that it would be a comet or a meteor that landed in the sea. Because it's not like it's not a hydrothermal vent that they're dragging out. That would be the only other possible fire from under the sea. But that's getting way too literal. So, no, the idea that this was a meteor that landed, which would have had a tail end of fire when it first fell, right. landing into the sea. And then that's something that you can then physically haul up and bring back onto the land. That makes the most sense. Right. And all the other myths of the Great King overlay on top of this. So he taunted the storm god who lashed down with a thunderbolt. That set a tree ablaze. And that's how he possessed the fire of the gods for humanity. So... The thunderbolt sounds like a meteor, and it's carrying the fire of the gods to the earth. Then we have the sea dragon, which in part sounds like it refers to a meteor. It's a dragon that drowns whole islands. So a meteor that lands in the water, makes tidal waves that drown islands, trigger earthquakes that collapse land into the sea. 
So yes, if you and then Grey King is said to possess the fire of the sea dragon and warm his hall with it. So what is that fire of the sea dragon? It could be the meteor magic, right? So that it kind of fits all of these things is the fire of the gods, the fire of the sea dragon, fire of the storm god, and the fire that came out of the sea. The meteor fits all those descriptions. And the sea stone chair is a meteor that has magic power or a meteor associated stone that has magic power and seemingly came out of the sea. So it probably doesn't come from a shy. The sea stone chair is probably carved from the meteor that fell on the iron islands. But if this stuff is all coming from the moon, then we're going to have multiple meteor strikes, one at a shy, maybe one in Sothorios or near the Basilisk Isles or on the Basilisk Isles, and then one on the Iron Islands. And then so, yeah, maybe I've got the timeline a little bit wrong. And maybe like what's going on is it's right after the long night that the first men are getting hybridized and the Grey King comes along a little later because he's fleeing from a shy. So maybe he's fleeing years later and arriving a couple decades afterward, something like that. That's why I don't try to get too specific. But there also could be multiple meteor cycles too. That almost makes more sense. Uh, and then, right, Bloodstone Isle on the Stepstones is another Blackstone meteor clue, exactly. Um, so there's multiple meteor strikes, at least with the one Long Night event, and there could be multiple cycles. Um, and in real life, if anything happened to the moon and it was cracked and floating up there, we'd be getting hit with meteors periodically all the time. There'd be periodic showers of them. So... It could be that all these yeah. comets are actually coming from an asteroid belt that used to be the moon or something like that. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like, if if it is that the hybrid, the hybridization, or at least, like, more rampant hybridization and farming of Deep Ones happens after the Long Night, then that could be just the Deep Ones responding to it because... Deep Ones would technically, we wouldn't want to think of Deep Ones being in league with the others because Deep Ones don't want to end life. They need, they need people. Yeah. They need them to breathe. They That's would have right. just as much, Deep Ones would have just as much to lose from the others winning as humanity would. So them having, so them farming more humans after the long night could have been their own response of, we need to be prepared for when this happens again for our for us because we they they will die too if the other's goal really is to extinguish all life then we have to think in that terms all life not just humanity it would also mean giants and which and we've seen that too because giants are trying to get as south at least some of them are trying to get down south with the free folk along with them because they're getting hit with by the others too like the, the others aren't 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 making exceptions for other magical beings. They're lumping yeah. anything with warm blood into the yeah, anyone, I mean, anything with warm blood is getting checked in the same box. They're parallel to the others in a lot of ways, but they're not working together. No, I don't I don't think there's yeah. any tangible connection between them. Um maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I think rise of right now. I think so. it's the Cotter it's that Cotter Pike line of dead things in the water makes it seem as if they're in league with the others, but it could be that they're running away too. Oh, that reminds me of another thing um, about uh, the bastards on the Iron Islands. They get the last name Pike. That's why Cotter Pike is called Cotter Pike. So this mm -hmm. is a good clue that like Pike is the original locus point of Iron Island civilization. And the idea of calling all of these nameless bastards Pike it sort of mm -hmm. just fits in with like all these patched face thralls that lose their identity and lose their language. They're all just Pike. Like they belong to Pike. They're sons of Pike, you know? Yeah. So. Cause if, if it's, it's weird. Cause if it were to follow the other naming conventions from the other kingdoms, like sand and hill and snow, you would think that bastards on the iron islands would just get the last name irons or something. But no, they get Pike, a specific place on the Iron Islands. Oh, and of course, because Pike are also fish, they're calling them fish. Cotter Pike is Cotter Fish. Just like Dagon Cod is Dagon Fish. He caught a fish. Yeah. Caught a fish. 
All right. So let's see. Uh, there's a thing. Okay. And this will, Kelly Johnson had a question about the Roin and the Roinar and how that might tie in. So I think, yes, freshwater fish. We talked about that. We talked about that and how that fits in with um, freshwater or coastal waters. That the idea that the original Ironborn were not pirates and mariners, but rather land-based first men who got deep one farmed. Yes. Uh, but, okay. So, if there's a thing such as water magic, what's the number one thing a water wizard would be able to do, do you think, Tim? Just speculating. Not even ice and fire. In any universe... There's something called a water wizard. What can he do? Mm. Well, I know I'm thinking in don't ever think in the it. story. I just want an easy answer. Well, the wa the water torrent was my was my go to answer because that's what they did in the the Roinar and the Dragon War was the water torrent, the walls of water that he's they raised raising. walls of water. That's right. And I'm just saying on an even more basic level, Cleo. Flooding. Yeah. A water wizard can control the water. So, yeah, Howland Reed can turn earth to mud by controlling water. Water wizards can raise walls of water. Um, House Merlin has the twining water spouts. So that implies that water magic can raise water spouts. It's just, it's so super obvious, okay? So if there is hydromancy, thank you. Water benders, water kinesis. Yeah. Beautiful. Can they, can, are they blood benders though? <laughs> We're talking avatar terms. <laughs> well, we see that like the Valerians are shaping molten rock. Mm -hmm. So that's very similar. Um, okay, so if there is water magic going on, then it surely is going on in these places where there are Deep Ones cult. And sure enough, Aaron seems to think about this a lot. And the waters of wrath will rise high, and the drowned god will spread his dominion across the Greenlands. Um, and I think there's another one that I missed, but there is, yeah, it talks about uh, praying to the drowned god to raise, you know, the waves. You know, send the, you know, smite the enemies with the waves or something like that. And then Asha refers to the drowned god as he who dwells beneath the waves, in all caps, which I thought was interesting. But I do think there is a potential tie, like the Roinar working water magic. I don't know that that means they were hybridized, but it could be that like water magic exists on its own and the deep ones can tap into the water magic. But there are humans that aren't, don't seem connected to the deep ones that also can do the water magic. Like the Roinar are river people and the uh, Fisher Queens live on a, a freshwater inland sea, not not anything that's connected to the ocean. So I asked him before, are there inland deep ones? Are there river deep ones? And you said, no, not really. They're all ocean beings. So I think the answer is that there is water magic that you can do, period. Mm -hmm. um, but the deep ones, the deep ones are surely amongst those who can do water magic. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that like the well the deep ones when it comes to are there when we think of the one the classic squishers that like Dick Crap Nimble Dick is talking about, those are in the ocean. Um but then like I said, the men of Ib, they're squishers, they're the froggy squishers, but they do live in a city on a lake, so they're not in the ocean. It depends on the class and that's going back to the whole True. squisher hierarchy and the classification. You have your fish ones, you have your frog ones. And you have your reptilian ones. It's not okay. that like the switch. It's more that you're not going to find the fish ones far from the ocean. If you're finding if you're finding some kind of deep one or squisher farther away, either on a river or further inland, then chances are they're less fish and they're going to have more amphibian or more reptilian characteristics. But that lines up nicely. We also talked was, about the origins of House Tully and how they've got. Um, What's their fish? A trout, which is a river fish. And they might connect back to House Fisher, which has a catfish, which is another inland river fish. Um, and they mm -hmm. and House Fisher, of course, would have been Fisher Kings. So. Yeah. 
And that's why, like, in Lovecraft's Ib, it makes sense for his Ibanese to be frogmen, because even though they live in a stone city, they live on a lake. So that's very amphibian-like. You spend half your life in the water and half your life on land. Unlike the fish deep ones who are eventually going to have to return primarily to water. That's why the hybridization works, because if they were full fish deep one, they'd have to stay on the water like the majority of the time. I, I guess like Lovecraft kind of makes his fishy deep ones like mud skippers, you know, they can be outside of the water, but not just not for too long, but enough to get get to places. Eldrick Stone which stand stands for Check out my um he's pointing out that Cat Tully is a catfish. Check out that Origins of House Tully stream. There's a lot of cool wordplay that I think you will dig. And that is one of them. Okay, I'm sorry. What were you what, where were we going, Tim? Oh, I just it was that question at the very beginning when you were tell when you were kind of telling that person, like, don't think too hard about it, but about like, well, how would the deep ones mate with women? Wouldn't the women drown if they took them into the water? And the answer is like, well, no, the male deep ones can stay on land long enough to do the deed. It's not like they, it's not like they're going to die the moment they leave the water. They can survive for some time off of it to do what they need to do, yeah. but they need the high, they need the hybrid children who, who can spend uh, so that they can have ones who can spend even more time, like years rather than just days outside of the water you just got to be waist deep in the water someone's saying <laughs> but i said like that's why hybridization makes the most sense that because the hybrids have characteristics that make them stronger for the species than just being a full-on deep one because then they're limited to what they can do on land yeah now so an important concept is this idea of being given to the drowned god so when people are drowned by the damp hair, that's what he says, or be given to the drowned god. We came from the sea, into the sea we must return. So, mm. fill your lungs with water that you may die and be reborn. So, dying and being reborn in the sea is the same as being given to the drowned god. And this is just going back to the Patchface whiting thing. Patchface dies and is reborn to the sea, and now has a psychic connection to under the waves. So, that's what it means. And it's being spelled out there. Um, that everyone's got to be given to the drowned god. And that's, again, so that the deep ones or whatever can maintain psychic control over everyone on the Iron Islands. And so, let's see here. It, uh... Oh, yeah. So, when he's... Aaron snorted. That Stefari inspired been given to the drowned god soon after birth. He had no doubt. He knew the manner of it, too. A quick dip in a tub of seawater that scarce wet the infant's head. Small wonder the ironborn had been conquered when they who once held sway everywhere of the sound of waves was heard. So, like, hybridization makes you tough, like biter. It makes you strong. But because they don't do as much hybridization anymore, they've grown weak. So that's literally true, what Dan Pear is saying. It sounds like just a very, oh, woe is me. But it's actually true. Like, yeah, they've been weakened and conquered. Because you yeah. couldn't conquer a whole island of biters. Or at least it'd be hard. I mean, you could, but it'd be hard. Yeah. <laughs> that's why the Make the Iron Islands Great Again meme works so much for Euron. Well, maybe Even that's why they Aaron... Go ahead. I was saying, for as much as Aaron hates Euron, he does want to go back to a more national, like a more how we would view nationalistic time for Ironborn. Just his idea of that would be when they, when they were more, uh, more like deep ones than they were Greenlanders, as he would call them. Um, I just joined, so sorry, this has been asked. How do you think Howland will appear in the story? I don't know. And will he shine light on this section of the lore? Probably not. Um, I think Howland Reed is going to be RLJ stuff, but... I'm sure George will use Howland to sw slip us a few more clues, but he's not going to explain the squisher stuff to us, no. I would not expect that. Um, let's see here. So Aaron talks about the storm god casting Balin down, and that he's now in the drowned god's watery halls, feasting with mermaids. So... I guess the point is, like, 
being going down to the drowned god's watery halls, being given to the drowned god, it's all about being drowned and resurrecting and stuff. So when you say that he who drowned for us, like it just brings me back to this idea that it must have been the first or the first people who were hybridized and did this patch facing and came back as the first prophets and kings of the ironborn. So I think that's what this is about. Let me see if there's any other quotes I want to read. Well, yeah, because when you take when you're taking that drowning test, you are taking that big risk 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 on yourself. It's very black and white what's gonna happen. Either you're gonna die or you either you die or you live. So that's why when they say like he who drowned for us and died for us, and it's like, well, maybe he didn't full on die, but he did take a very big risk of it happening. The fact that he pulled through and was able to come back is is the key is the significant sign. I mean the first time it happened, it would have been a complete miracle, absolutely. So Yeah. <laughs> And then there's a Euron's Blasphemies quote that I forgot. Euron's Blasphemies will bring down the drowned God's wrath upon us all. Um, and he says, uh, the king's moot raised him up and you put the driftwood crown upon his head yourself. That's Victorian talking to Euron, or talking to Aaron. And um, yeah, Victorian says, the drowned God raised him up, let the drowned God cast him down. So it was just like, Again, just more of everything being the will of the people under the sea that dictates their whole culture. So the more you think about the drowned priests being patch-faced out, psychic, linked to the deep ones, their whole culture makes sense. And I just want to follow up on that. And let's see here. <laughs> Germanic unity, huh? <laughs> Feels... Could be a fine handle, or it could be a very sketchy handle. I'm not sure what's going on there. All right, so let's see if any other Kelly Johnson's questions apply to what we're talking about. Uh, asking about Olthos, we talked about that. How much do you think the High Towers remember of the Great Empire of the Dawn? Well, they might have books. They might know. That's one of the few places where they might have some original knowledge. And we've not seen too many high towers, so we don't know what they know. Um, it's a great question, but one without an answer, Kelly. Do you have any speculation on that, Tim? I actually don't. <laughs> That's one of those... I do think there's something oh. Euron wants. Either a book or a magic artifact that Euron will give Euron power or knowledge at at Old Town, but I just don't know what it is. Yeah, I think Euron, I think Euron feels like he probably has what he needs with the Valyrian steel armor and the dragon and the dragon horn. But if he does come upon Sam and somehow gets his hands on the horn of Winter, that might be a lucky break. Or it could be just like how Jock and Hagar is there um, disguised as Pate. We think that Jock is probably there looking for a specific book Maybe Euron, it could, Euron might be looking for something like that. Yeah, I think he's looking for something. Yeah, either a, not that book, but like maybe a different book or... I don't know, maybe he wants that one. Maybe the Faceless Men are trying to steal it so Euron can't get it, actually. It kind of makes sense. Yeah. But yeah, I tend to well, think there's... Like, go ahead. Well, I've said like Euron's whole magic maelstrom that he's trying to pull off here, tying the damp hair, tying the... Uh, septons and warlocks to the prows of a ship and a woman carrying its child it seems like he's throwing every magical thing he can think of at the wall and just seeing what sticks yep yeah, would seem so and I, and I just yeah I'm really I, I love how there's like a bunch of different theories about how Euron's gonna die like so many people want to kill him there's so many different ways he could get a comeuppance he deserves all of them at once. You know, how will George handle it? It's fun. But I do like the idea that the drowned god, like his blasphemy against the drowned god, is a real thing. Because it, it just sounded like Aaron complaining. But now it's like, wait, no, there are beings down there that the Ironborn worship. And he's making fun of them. But then in the dream, he's turning into a squid face. And it's just like, oh, they're going to use him like a sock puppet. So... Euron's going to get possessed. It's just a matter of, is it going to be by like 
Night King spirit or Deep One intelligence. <laughs> this will be funny. Throwing magic things at the wall. Ah, ah, ah. Yeah, that is something that we're literally going to be talking about. All right, cool. Well, I guess this is a good place to wrap this up. And uh, yeah, final thoughts, Tim? Oh, I can't hear you. You're muted for some reason. Nope. He's like, damn. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks, everyone. Go subscribe to Grey Waste Tim's channel. His new video, A Color Out of a Shy, is fantastic. I watched it this morning. And we talked about it today. So go watch that. Subscribe to Grey Waste Tim. Subscribe to my channel. Watch my Deep Ones video if you haven't already. And uh, yeah, I've got a Damon Targaryen video coming out this week. So enjoy that. Thank you, Tim. Not sure what happened, but always fun to stream with you, buddy. So. <laughs> How did I get in this nutshell? <laughs> okay. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you guys later. Where's the off button? There it is. Cheers and thank you. <laughs>